right, so we should get started because uh, it's 6.30, so I'm going to call uh, the meeting to order. Uh, so the first thing is to review and approve the agenda, and I, just looking through it now, I don't think we have any changes to make. Um, it is uh, quite a, a long agenda for tonight, so I just want to bring that to folks' attention and uh, just ask that folks are conscious of um, of our potentially long agenda this evening. Um, that's that's as much for for us as uh, for uh, folks uh, watching or, or present here. Um, but otherwise, I don't think there are any changes. Um, I know. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think that's I think that's it. So we're going to move on to uh, general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to uh, weigh in on a topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, for the evening. If you do have a comment that is pertinent to um, a topic on our agenda, then you can uh, make those comments uh, adjacent to uh, the, those items. Uh, you'll have an opportunity when those items come up. Uh, but if it's otherwise not on our agenda, now is the time. And this is true for all public comments in general. If you would say your name, where you live, and uh, try to keep your comments to about two minutes, that is very helpful. Um, so, having said all of that, um, would anyone like to make a comment or address the council? I, uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. I would ask uh, a mild accommodation because I'm going to cover. Oh, one thing is on the consent agenda. I hope it's pulled and I can comment on it there. A couple things related to uh, Transit Center in Girton Park. So uh, related to the Good Samaritan. Uh, to that item, yes. So uh, I will skip over that one in the trust that it gets pulled off the consent agenda. Sure. I'm going to pass a photo around uh, taken tonight uh, of the Girton Park. And another photo taken last Friday of our sidewalks and our Christmas uh, decorations. So we use our public work staff to put up to decorate the town and trucks. Meanwhile, we're leaving our storm drains clogged. And there was one occasion where there was 10 inches of water backed up all across Elm Street, both lanes up into the sidewalks. and still the ice and the puddles and the storm drains are not cleared but yet we can dedicate our public work staff to uh, putting up decorations which promptly broke down and litter the sidewalks for day after day after day so i'm questioning the priorities uh we i understand from talking to our public works director that we're severely short-staffed and quote there is no money but that's not excuse for leaving unsafe and icy sidewalks and bridges. Uh, even tonight, the sidewalks are not salted. They're covered with a thin layer of snow and they're icy and slippery. I could have skied all the way over here. So this is a, a real problem. And I think you should consider directing staff and police force to walk out there with buckets of sand if we have to, to address icy spots. I interrupted a meeting that the city manager and assistant were having to alert Donna of that problem because public works had forgotten a section of the north side of State Street between Elm and Main. Uh, everything else had been sanded, but that section was pure ice. And still, I drive to Rutland and back, and it's still not done. Uh, so we have a real problem with y'all not being on the street to see what I see and others feel and slip and fall. And you just don't believe it when I bring it to you. These are, th this turns towards negligence, okay? Um, I made records request uh, of the city manager's office for the whole, regarding our decision not to become a, or to no longer be a public safety answering point. I got half a response and it, I've learned it's futile to file appeals to the head of the agency, but y'all direct and manage the city manager and for him to just neglect to find those records 
is unconscionable, especially when you know it's a repeat pattern. The same with the bathrooms, right of the public to use the bathrooms in city center. So I, I can tell you're more interested in reading your email than hearing this, but uh, I'd like to request that you explicitly authorize any entity using the city's room for a Zoom hybrid meetings to utilize the equipment. We have a real problem with public safety authority refusing to plug into the screen uh, or the amplified speakers and participants uh, cannot see who's speaking, cannot be heard and cannot hear. So if, if you're gonna make the city's facility available for Zoom, why not make the, the Zoom equipment available too? There's no reason not to. I'd ask you to take action on that tonight if it needs action. Um, I will just address the Girton Park to have moved it and to have denied these folks restful sleep who were sleeping there and privacy, and then to not even bother to sand the, the sloped walkway, which didn't exist in its prior location, and have people having to slip and fall on ice to get into their uh, undignified shelter is, again, unconscionable. Uh, I ask you all to grow a little compassion. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, do we uh, do we know what the process is for getting the uh, AV equipment used for uh, meetings here? I'm not sure anyone's asked if they have. Do you know? I'm not sure anyone's requested to use it. I don't know if we, what do you, I'm so sorry, what's the, the if somebody else, a non-city agency, was using this room and wanted to have a Zoom meeting, could they use the screen and the sound system? They and could I, if they wanted to. I would help them set yeah. that up, but there's no requirement that they do that. Right. No, it's their meeting. They can do what they want, but we certainly would. We, the city we wouldn't. Is a member of public safety. Um, we're we're going to keep. We're going to keep going. They are not a city agency, so we would not. Re we can't require another agency to conduct how they conduct their meetings. We would assist them if they wanted to. Okay. Great. That's. Thank you. <clears throat> so that could happen. Yeah. Yeah. I think it is the available. Most effective way to make those uh, hybrid meetings work. So sounds good. Thanks. Okay. okay. Um, anyone else? Oh, if you'd come up and <laughs> say your name and all that. Peter Kelman, uh, I live in Montpelier, and I requested that um, the uh, a tel television story on Channel two, uh, 22 be shown uh, this evening. Um, yeah, thank you. And so you're you're ceding your time to the to to yeah. this uh, clip. Thank you very much. Okay. No, no, that's fine. I just want to make sure everyone was clear about what was happening. in central Vermont who are living outdoors and even more living in the motels. Morgan Brown spent 12 years living outside. Regardless of weather conditions and temperature, it's hard, period. Were there ever days when you were living outside where you felt like you weren't going to make it? Yes, many. Uh, I don't know how I survived. It took a huge toll. There were days when in this type of weather, at night, I'm walking around with no place to go, and I'm praying to God to take me. Not that I want to die, but I couldn't cope. In July 2015, Tammy Menard became homeless with her husband and two dogs. She said cold winter nights brought a lot of stress. It's the constant fear of freezing. It's the constant fear of worry of trying to stay warm. Menard says there is a stigma people experiencing homelessness face. Not everybody's drug addicts. Not everybody is alcoholics. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people turn to that eventually after being on the streets just because of so much stress. Over an eight day period in November, three local homeless people died, according to Ken Russell, chair of Montpelier's Homelessness Task Force and executive director of Another Way. There were 
definitely substances involved with some of them. Governor Phil Scott reinstated the state's emergency motel program through March 2022. But Russell says this is still not enough. We need long-term housing solutions. We need money invested in housing. And now that Tammy has a bed in warm apartment, it means everything. It was a relief, a huge, huge relief mm -hmm. to be able to feel safe and know that I can stay warm. I also spoke with Don Little, the state outreach coordinator from Good Samaritan Haven and Barry, and she told me if you have clothing or food to donate, now is the time. Reporting live in the newsroom, Dana Casulo, Local 22 News. Okay, thank you, Peter. And um, I have some thoughts on this that I want to share, but I'm going to hold off. Um, on that for now, because I know other folks may want to speak. Um, I'm going to go with other folks in person first. Anyone else in person wish to address the council? Okay, seeing nobody. Um, Morgan Brown, I see your hand is up. Go ahead. Uh, Morgan Brown, uh, Montpelier resident, District 3. Uh, briefly, I just want to clarify. It was corrected on the uh, uh, article page the text uh however when it when it says that i lived uh outside for 12 years actually uh it would be more accurate to say that i lived unhoused for 12 years the last go around okay just wanted to clarify thank you yeah thank you anyone else uh online Uh, you can use the uh, raise hand uh, function, which is under reactions, or you can uh, just uh, unmute yourself and let, let us know you'd like to speak or turn your camera on and, and wave um, that all of those options are good. <clears throat> um, I also just want to, um, uh, as a, a, a new uh, point, I, I think this is something I'd like to do is for those of you who are online, um, if you would uh, make sure that your name says both your first and last names um, so that I can uh, address you properly, that would be great. And I think most of you do, but I just thought I'd uh, at least put that out there. Um, uh, all right, anyone, anyone else wish to make a comment? Uh, Carolyn, would you like to make a comment? Oh, uh, I just heard you unmuting yourself. <laughs> yes, I would. I, you know, I mean, I find it very sad that the public, that the public in, in Montpelier, isn't aware of how serious the circumstances are. That I think we've all been lulled to thinking that everybody got to go to the motels and lived happily ever after, and that's simply not the case. That there are about four dozen people living out outside, and. Um, this brief clip indicates um, how sad that is uh, and how we need to do more. Thank you. And Linda Berger, I see you, your hand is up. Yes, I have a question about item number 11. Um, when that item comes up, will there be an opportunity for the public to ask questions um, about the information presented? Yes, there will be. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Good, good question. Um, anyone else? All right. Uh, well, so uh, especially in light of the news clip that we just saw and the article that was in the bridge um, recently about um, some unhoused folks who died recently, um, that was something that I uh, spent a lot of time thinking about. And I, I did end up calling uh, Ken Russell, uh, the chair of our uh, homelessness task force, it's just to check in to say like, where are we at? What do we need to be doing? Um, and so I've asked uh, the homelessness task force to come back, not tonight, but at our next meeting, um, just to to keep us informed. I mean, if there is, um, I know there are some projects that are in the works and that there may be um, other things that we can be um, doing. That, that this is all stuff that I think we just need to keep on our radar and keep um, keep pushing on. So um, I, I just want to at least let uh, you folks on the council and the public know that that is something that is um, on my mind and um, 
are hoping to have them on the next agenda. Um, <clears throat> uh, Vicki, yes. Yes. Um, one, uh, I don't know how to put my full name on the oh. Zoom, but <laughs> okay. so I guess you'll just have to deal with it. Um, <laughs> on a uh, sober note there, though, about the three people um, that passed away, I would hope that there's some way that we can somehow find out who they were and honor them in some way. Um, because you do when you work in and you do things out in the community, you get to know some of these people, and um, you know, I it just seems as though we should be able to find a way to honor their lives um, rather than simply say three people died unhoused, because we never do find out yeah, who they true. were, and you never know why you're not seeing someone you're used to seeing. Um, and everybody deserves to be, to have their lives honored in some fashion. <clears throat> Thank you, Vicki. And just so you know, if, if you wanna change how your name appears, you go down to uh, participants and uh, then the, all the participants should appear. And then next to your name uh, should uh, appear a, a blue button that says more and then you can click on rename and uh, you should be able to change your name that way if, just as an FYI but thank you also for your comment um Lisa uh Rochelle it's that's Vicki Lane yes okay uh go ahead Lisa yes my name is Lisa Rochelle I live in Montpelier Vermont and I just uh, wanted to express my deep sorrow in the um the fact that we even have unhoused in the uh in the capital of Vermont. And um, I think the best way to honor um, folks is to work even harder to find solutions and use every avenue uh, that we have to build communities and not just shelter people, but permanently house them with dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Um, well. Mia, it's Morgan Brown again. I just <laughs> want to uh, say amen to uh, what was just said there. And uh, I totally agree with that. And uh, I hope that we're able to do more along those lines. Thank you. Thank you, Morgan. Anyone else? Okay. All right. Well, um, thank you, everybody. And uh, so we're going to move on for now uh, to the consent agenda. And uh, there's is there a motion? Uh, I think we would <clears throat> move the consent agenda and then um, move take the consent things, agenda and then take things off. <laughs> uh, yes. Um, just a request to move item F, the Housing Trust Fund recommendation, off the consent agenda. Oh, is there a second? Uh, oh, I'll, I'll second. Uh, <laughs> give me a second. Do we have, have you yeah, for some reason. First, then, then the rest. You'd think that I would have remembered that. Um, <laughs> so, um, so pulling item F, if that's okay with you, Jack? Yeah. Okay, so the motion is second. Any further discussion about... Um, any consent agenda item? Okay. Uh, all right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? All right, let's take up item F. I believe there is a comment on it. I can be brief. Uh, I have mentioned this numerous times before <clears throat> that when city money is being passed to a nonprofit, uh, the transparency and the accountability uh, is lacking. Uh, especially right now, access to the bathrooms in the transit center is being negotiated through Good Samaritan or another way, neither of which is subject to public records law. And we don't have, we have a problem with a, a particular person who has been served a no trespass order from the transit center sleeping in the church. And she was sitting outside on Thanksgiving day with no place to stay warm. And 
we don't have a system that fills these gaps or sees who's falling through the net. And there needs to be, if we're going to give ten a hundred thousand dollars to Good Samaritan towards the the new shelter project, we need some accountability and some transparency. And in prior, I raised this over several years. There's been a we don't need to look at what they're doing with our money. I, I say we do. Uh, we absolutely need to condition those contracts on some degree, maybe not the full transparency of state law that a public agency has, but an, an enhanced level of transparency of communications of where the things are falling apart. People were sexually assaulted at Good Samaritan. People had their property stolen. Uh, people have died at Good Samaritan and they're not subject to public records law. So when you're talking about giving them $100,000 from our housing trust fund, now is the time to put some accountability provisions into that. Also, we need to make sure that the negotiation for use of the transit center as a warming space has a provision to lift the no trespass order against this person. She's too articulate for her own good, but she also needs a bathroom and to be in, in a warm space. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on this particular item? No? Okay. Is there a motion? Move that we approve item F. I'll second it. Okay. Motion to second. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. So uh, item F passes. And we have uh, a few appointments to make. And so the way uh, I'd like to arrange this is to see if any of uh, the candidates for any of the three uh, committees that we're talking about are present with us. I'd like to hear from all of them. Um, and then we can either go into executive session or uh, just have a vote either way. Um, so just to check here, um, I, uh, Justin Dr Dressel, you're here. Yes, would you like to um, uh, come up and address the council, introduce yourself, and uh, just tell us about your interest in serving on the CBPSA? Everybody, Justin Dreschler, was here a few weeks ago. Um, I am a Montpelier resident. I applied to the CVPSA. Uh, I, you know, I'm interested in public safety generally, obviously, which is why I applied to be on the police review committee. Um, I am particularly interested in this because dispatch was the the area of the police review committee that I had the most focus on. Um, seems like something that would be interesting. That is kind of right up my alley. I care, you know. I really I care about getting things done. I'm really committed to the city. We only moved up here a few years ago, but we're here for the long haul, just trying to, you know, give whatever help I can. So, um, so yeah, I, I tried to go into detail on my application. I also think that, like, I'm pretty easy to work with. Lauren and Jack both worked with me on the uh, police review committee, and there are many things that I did not see eye to eye with on members of the committee, but I do think that we had a, uh, a good working relationship. So, there we are. Thank you. Any questions? Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, for the Complete Streets Committee, we have three uh, folks up for appointment there, uh, potentially. Uh, so John Kim, Nancy Schultz, and Brett Apple. Um, I was just going to see if, uh, are any of them in person? Any of you in person? Nope, okay. Um, and just checking online, are any of you with us through Zoom? I don't see uh, any of them here digitally. Uh, so, oh, John, John. Here. Oh, oh, John. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> John, Kim, would you like to uh, uh, introduce yourself to the council? Tell us about uh, your interest in uh, serving on the Complete Streets Committee. Yeah, sure. Hi, uh, my name is John Kim. Um, I've been a resident of Montpelier for about actually just a year now, but my my wife's from Central Vermont in the in the general area, and we moved here recently, and and are also um, looking forward to call Montpelier home for for a while. Um, I'm interested in the Complete Streets Committee as just a avid biker and um, you know person who who chose. I you know we purposefully decided to live in town so that we could. Uh, take advantage of make being in a walkable city, and we. I, I'm just very interested in, in you know making sure that the city 
can be a place that is accessible to all, um, you know, via walking, biking, or whatever uh, methods of getting around without having to rely on cars, you know, both for myself, but for our kids. So yeah, I'd be interested in serving on the committee. I've worked for a long time in kind of corporate sustainability roles, and I'd be interested in kind of being more engaged in the, in the, the city that I'm living in. Thank you. Great, thank you. Any questions for John Kim? Okay, all right, thank you. Um, and I don't see Jean Leon in person um, or, or online, am I correct? I don't see uh, Jean on here. Um, yes, uh, Jay. Just to clarify, I, I don't know if it was a mistake uh, on with Jean's application or maybe like the agenda was put together, but Jean was applying for a, a permanent position on the development re review board. And what we're seeing is the design review board. Oh, DRB okay. is DRB. I know it's super confusing, but oh. I just want to make sure there's some clarity there. Right. It, it actually should, like, if it was the design review, it would be the design review committee. committee. It should be the DRC. To, right. Anyways, it's, it's small. Design. I just want Thank to make you. sure we have some clarity. That's yep. Uh, right. He was actually applying to the development review board. Yes. Right. Thank you. It's a good catch. Um, but I otherwise don't see him on. I, I think that's correct. Uh, all right, so uh, Council, what would you like to do? Jack? Pursuant to 1BSA section 313A3, I move we enter executive session to discuss the appointment of one or more public uh, officers. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? All right, we will be right back. Uh, all right, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, so we're back in regular session, and I think we're going to do this in parts. Uh, is there a, a motion, Jack? I move that we uh, appoint Justin Dressler to the CDPSA board. Uh, I worked with uh, Justin on the police review commission, and he did a tremendous amount of work, and I think he will be... Uh, Tremendous asset to that board. Second. All right, so a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? OK, is there another motion? Yes, go ahead. Yep, I'd like to make a motion that we appoint uh, John Kim, Nancy Schultz, and Brett Appel to the um, Complete Streets Committee. We're thankful for all of their willingness to participate in this. and. Um, think that they'll bring a lot of value to the process. So, is there a second? A second. Okay. Uh, further discussion. All right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Um, and uh, regarding the uh, development review board, I wish, we just wanted to note that there are actually three vacancies, uh, and we're um, hoping for a larger pool. So, um, Mr. Leon's uh, service as an alternate. Uh, will continue through um, uh, at least uh, the summer here. And so we'd uh, like to take that all together. So we're, we're asking staff to um, reopen that. And so we can um, hopefully find candidates for all of the positions. Um, all right, so that is that topic. Uh, and then, so moving on to uh, the uh, City of Montpelier mask mandate uh, for this um, I assume I'm either going to turn it over to Cameron or to Bill. Well, um, we're happy to start it. I think um, obviously the council had asked that we put this on. Most people are aware that the legislature at the governor's request uh, provided authority to the local governments to uh, put in local mask mandates uh, with certain limitations. And uh, this is on the agenda for consideration. We have drafted one based on thing. Uh, some models we'd seen certainly can make any changes that you like um, and obviously you need to determine whether you want to do that so that's all I have Donna go ahead well I find the sentence under the requirement to wear face covering confusing above it it says require indoor requires indoor inside any building within city limits but below it, it talks about anybody who enters a public, comma, city-owned facility. 
So I guess I need to know if it enters any public building and city owned. I, I get confused if the public relates to the city owned or any public building. So, so the, it's intended to include any public building. That was our mandate. That was our order previously. We already have a, a, a rule that we've put in place about city owned buildings. So this is expanding it to any businesses, any businesses that are open to the public. So if it's not clear in the way it's worded, we can certainly try to clear that up. Yeah, I actually, because I saw that as well, and I actually have um, some alternate um, language that right. I would um, like to propose. I'm going to try to get my Zoom back here. I, I closed my computer, my Zoom disappeared. Um, so uh, because I, I think it was, uh, the language in the draft uh, emergency order was similar to like an, an order around like just uh, publicly owned buildings. Um, so let me see if I can uh, get to that. Yeah, sure. That would be that would be great. It's going to take me just a second here to get back. Any other comments, just generally about the mask mandate? While I'm getting stuff together here. Okay. Um, so down. Um, mm -mm -mm. This is the not the. This is not the resolution. Oh, a building open to the public. Yeah. So I was on the second page. Let's see what I wrote. No, it's on, it's under the requirement to to wear face covering. Yeah, this is the one I found. Yeah. Right there. Mm -hmm. Oh, this is a change then from what's here. Yeah, so under at least the draft that I have, uh, where does it say this? Oh, right, requirement to wear face coverings. Um, so the right now it says effective immediately any person, whether an employee, a customer, or a visitor who enters a public city-owned facility must wear face coverings over their nose and mouth while inside the building, regardless of their vaccination status. I thought that made it sound like it had to be a city owned facility. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would uh, propose that instead uh, it say uh, effective immediately any person, whether an employee, a customer or a visitor who enters a uh, public or private building that is open to the public must wear face coverings over their nose and mouth while inside of the building. And then I'd add this. Um, and in the presence of others, because that was a clause that we had from our previous draft. Do you remember that? We had to, it was also like in the presence of others. Um, and then uh, continue on regardless of their vaccination status. So, so where would you have that, that, that sounds great. Where would you put that second part? So after the word building, mm -hmm. so over their nose and mouth while inside the building and in the presence of others. And presence of Thank you. Yep. And so it, it strikes the yep. city owned facility uh, part. Is that I, clear? Much better. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead, Jack. It, it's, it might make it less clear to me because does that mean that if someone enters a building that's open to the public, but there's nobody else there, it, they're not subject to the requirement because they're not in the presence of others? I, I would think so, right? If you're the only one there, maybe that's okay. I don't know. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, just remembering the conversation that was mostly due to employees who are in a store working all day, and it's a chance to take a mask off if there's no nobody else inside the building. That's, okay. That was the motivation for it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. One Lauren. other, the kind of title of it, I think will be confusing. Um, so wearing face coverings required indoors inside any building within Montpelier city limits, maybe any public, publicly accessible building within Montpelier city limits. So we're not saying, I know that if you read the details, but if this goes out and people see like, right, like in, in my home, in my home, I have to wear a mask. Right. So just for yep. some clarity. Yep. Maybe we should just say public building rather than public accessible building, because when you start to use the term accessible, 
it gets into or it get make gets people thinking about handicap accessibility. Oh, see, just any building open to the public that is open to the public. Open to the same public. Same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Does that work for you, Jack? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's yeah. That's a good point. Um, any other comments? I, I'll just say for myself, I am uh, very interested in voting for this. I think uh, this is, um, especially given where we are at in terms of cases right now, um, this is something we need to be doing. Um, other, th uh, Jack. I completely agree. We what we are seeing is a continued growth in the uh, in the number of cases, and it is vital. <laughs> Vital to do what we can to uh, to prevent uh, further transmission of this uh, disease that's potentially deadly, and the science tells us that uh, vaccinations and masks are the two things that we can do that are really effective in protecting ourselves and the people we come into contact with. You know, people say this is my body my, my choice but it's not just my body it's anyone you run into run into you don't know even if you're willing to take that risk for yourself you don't know if you're infected and you don't know if you're exposing someone else who um, who might get a serious case thank you is it possible for us to accept the edits and have it effective as soon as possible Yes, it does say effective immediately. Okay. Um, Even with the edits, we could. Yeah, you just pass it as a menu. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Connor. Yeah, just a, just a couple of questions. Uh, exemptions the frustrates the essential purpose of the bu business. Is that, is that spelled out anywhere, or is that just sort of discretionary so, with the? So that was lang language crafted by former council member Richardson. That was in our prior order. And I believe that was intended um, to allow for when people are eating, um, that's a primary purpose of a restaurant, that you can't wear a mask while you're eating, that's or right. if you're getting your beard shaved, you have to put right, your hair salon down, probably, right? kind of thing. Yeah. So it was, it was intended to say, you know, yes, you have to have a mask, except for when you're, if it gets in the way of the primary. I can't think of anything that would be too gray in areas. So I think it's probably yeah, fine. Yeah, I, so we just took that exact language from our last order. And, and the other question, uh, if, State and county buildings are within city limits there. Would they fall under this or are they exempt from it? Uh, <laughs> well, I would argue that if the, if yes. the, I would say yes, um, because the state legislature gave this authority to local government. I don't know that they exempted themselves from it. Um, so, uh, yes. All right. I agree with that. Um, <laughs> And I, I, I would just end, I agree with Jack there. You know, we followed the science one way on this, and I, I think we did right last time. I, I think we got to follow the science when the numbers are taken up there. And I, it's unfortunate because I, I think largely the governor shirked his responsibility on this by opening up civil wars at select boards around the state. But if it's the right thing to do, you do it. So I, I support this. Uh, Jennifer. I just would like to say that, you know, wearing a mask is the lowest the lowest on the bar that we can do to protect each other. You don't have to be into getting vaccinated, but wearing a mask is super easy and uh, real cheap because you can get them for free. Right, uh, before, actually, um, uh, go ahead, Lauren, but we do have a couple hands of folks online. Yes. Oh, should I go for them first? Okay. Sure. All right, uh, Morgan Brown, I see that you have your hand up and then we'll go to Ann Gilbert. Go ahead, Morgan. Yeah, we're we're getting there. We're getting there. Uh, Morgan, do you have anything? Okay, I was waiting to get unmuted. Uh, it wasn't <laughs> letting me talk. All yes. right, uh, Morgan Brown, District Three, Resident Montpelier. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the draft policy. Uh, I wasn't aware there was one. It wasn't provided within. Uh, the agenda, uh, that's a problem uh, in the future. You know, if there's gonna be some policy uh, discussed by the city council, you know, voted on, please make it available 
it's not easy for some of us to go digging for it wherever it's hiding. Oh, excuse me, wherever it's available, sort of. Anyway, my comment is I support uh, very strongly uh, uh, the mayor's uh, wording, except um, I have concerns about the line when it comes to the indoor um, setting in the presence of others. And it's twofold. Um, one, there are businesses and stuff who have a policy that you have to wear a mask uh, when you're in their uh, business. So this line could contradict that and cause confusion. So if you're gonna keep that line in there in the presence of others, you need to add a caveat that says, unless um, a business or entity uh, instructs otherwise, something along that lines. The other problem about saying that, well, you don't need to uh, wear a mask. Well, basically you're, you're saying you don't need to wear a mask indoors uh, unless you're in the presence of others. Some places, you know, they're handling food and there's food around, like in shots and stuff and everything. You know, and I think it's just, you know, you got to be more careful about the wording and, and I, I think you want to work on that one a little bit. Um, the other concern I have is when, uh, I don't know what the policy was before, I can't recall, but when it comes to large outdoor gatherings, you know, people not, you know, are in closer proximity than six feet apart. I think that's a concern. And I think there should be a policy, you know, unless what the state is saying only applies to indoor and not outdoor gatherings, you know, maybe this is a discussion for another time, but I think, you know, we should be concerned about large outdoor gatherings too, you know, and people might want to be wearing masks there too. So that's my two cents. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Morgan. And I particularly on that last point, I mean, I think that's something that we can consider when there, when we get requests for, um, for large gatherings. I do want to note though, that uh, this draft was available uh, at least uh, digitally on the uh, website is under item eight. Uh, so if you go there, you can find the draft that we are discussing. Well, I saw the agenda, but I didn't see. Uh, let's, I let's, didn't see. Yep, it's there. It's available. I'm looking at it right now, and I don't see it. I just see that. Okay. It's on um, the agenda, but I don't see a link. It's so only Morgan, Cameron's going to send you directly a a link to it. Um, thank you, but that's after the fact, but thank you. Okay. Uh, Ann Gilbert, go ahead, and then we have Tracy Canino. Hi, thank you. Um, I didn't have a chance to look at the draft, and I can't remember if you mentioned this already. I just wondered if it would be good to have, um, regardless of vaccination status, uh, listed in there. Is that already in there? That is in there, yes. Okay, good. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Tracy Canino, go ahead, and then Diane Suffren. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I just, uh, I was able to read the, uh, the, the draft, which was great. Um, and to the point about the um, not in the presence of others for consideration of the council is even though people don't uh, say it enough that the virus actually is airborne and it will hang in the air uh, for quite some time even after someone has left. So you could have a space someone has entered, even if they're the only one, then unmasked, breathing in that space, then leave, and then someone else could come in, assume that they're alone, take the mask off and be breathing in that space and still become infected because the virus being airborne will remain in that air uh, unless there is uh, ventilation, which then gets into much more complicated uh, things, but it, it might be something to consider um, about that. 
Uh, and uh, I did just want to say, um, just to state uh, a thank you to everyone in the community who has already been masking, um, because uh, it's it's a, a very quiet kind of a daily um, kindness that they've been doing for others. And even though, uh, you know, maybe I don't say it to the person when I see them, um, I certainly appreciate uh, being about in my community and, and feeling safer because, you know, I, I know the masks uh, can feel like an inconvenience sometimes to some people that, and can be uncomfortable, but um, the fact that they've decided that the, the safety of other people and themselves is above a little um, discomfort for themselves is, is just a, a wonderful part of this community. And so I just wanted to actually say thank you to everyone who has been doing that. Thank you. And actually what your comment is making me think or realize is that um, that phrase in the presence of others, in as much as this is difficult to enforce, that part of it is, is particularly unenforceable because if someone wanted to check, then they're in the presence of someone else. So <laughs> you would never know, right? Like taking that part out might not even matter. Anyway, I'm just, sorry. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead, uh, Dan Sofran. Hi. Um, I'll just put my two cents in about that phrase as well. In addition to everything everyone has said, one of the dynamics that comes into play if something like that is in effect is that the onus then is on me to always be on the lookout as I turn a corner in the store, as I walk into another aisle. And this is one of the things that I find most upsetting um, as I negotiate my way around town is uh, I'm always on guard against my, my, uh, my neighbors, my, my fellow residents here. Um, and uh, so I, I think that's not a good thing. Um, no, one, no one wants to catch the virus. We don't want to catch the virus with all these new uncertainties with the changing variants and the uncertainties of how the vaccine is protecting us against these new variants. But um, not having masking causes, I think, a real crumbling of a sense of community and trust in others. Everyone, as I walk around town, everyone becomes suspect to me or a danger to me or potential danger to me. Where has someone been? Are they vaccinated? Are they positive and they don't know? And that's, <laughs> that's a major source of distress for myself um, as I walk around. I mean, I'm triple vaccinated, but you know, it's destroying the fabric of my sense of, of connection to other people here because I can't trust people. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is that ha not having a mask mandate forces me to do almost all of my shopping online, except for stores that require masks or do curbside. And, you know, I find it ironic that, you know, some people who are so concerned about the, the economic well-being of our businesses don't want the mask. I, I won't go into a store unless it's absolutely essential as long as there are no mask mandates. So I would be much more comfortable going into stores if there were, because all those other variables don't come into play. Um, the other thing I should say is that we do know that the masks work. I mean, I think about my dentists and doctors, and even before we had the vaccinations, they were relying totally on the masks. And, you know, I know my, speaking from my own, dentist and his office, they have had no problems and they were relying totally on masks looking into our mouths before anyone was vaccinated. So I just can't see how anybody can question the efficacy of the mask. Another thing that I wanted to mention is, and it's a very serious thing, is that our access to health care in the community is being compromised by all those people who are getting COVID and filling up the hospitals because they get sick when it all could be avoided by wearing masks as well as being vaccinated. So I'm, I'm very glad that you're reconsidering this again. I was very happy 
when you did it last time, before the governor called, as I remember, before the governor uh, declared a state of emergency. So I think you were really on the ball and it made me feel very proud of the city and comfortable to be in it. So um, I'm, I'm really glad you can, I urge you and support your effort to do it again um, so that um, we stay healthy and the, the sense of community and common good is, is strong. So thank you. And I also speak for my husband, he's here, Lou Friedland. We live right here in town. Thank you. You're welcome. And uh, Lee, I saw you turned your camera on. Did you want to make a comment? Uh, we can't hear you yet. Nope. Uh, I think you've got to unmute yourself. There you go. Also, um, if you would also say your last name for us. D-O-W, Dow. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. Um, mask mandated in public venues, you know, although inconvenient and perhaps only minimally effective to prevent transmission of colds and flus, would not offend my sense of freedom of choice. I would consider the requirement a nod to the concerns, fears of my community. Vaccines, on the other hand, I want to make it clear, um, I am not, uh, you know, anti-vax. I'm fully vaxxed. But mandated vaccine is a more nuanced issue, I think. Um, I personally, you know, I said I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Um, but to inquire, to require someone to inject a substance into his body, the long-term effects of which are not really yet known, is offensive to my sense of freedom of choice. Had I young children, I would be even more alarmed. Um, I understand the current rhetoric is calling the pandemic the pandemic of the unvaccinated, um, and that may be an accurate global description, but in my America, um, you know, I, I must have the power to make that decision for myself. I could be, and I'm, I'm not talking personally, but someone um, should have the power to make the decision for himself. Um, he or she or I could be discouraged to think that the welfare of the neighbors encouraged to think um, of the welfare of the neighbors of the community, but to require the person to be injected um, could cost him a job, the possible cancellation of his health insurance, his unemployment insurance possibly, and throw the whole social system into chaos. Um, so th those are my thoughts for whatever they're worth. Uh, so just to clarify, Lee, this particular item is not about uh, mandatory vaccinations. It's just about uh, masking in uh, buildings that are open to the public. Um, but just in case that was... Uh, oh, I thought it was a vaccine mandate too. Um, um, this particular item is not that we... There's related something related to that, I which think. is also not a vaccine mandate. Okay, but also not a vaccine mandate. So, but I just wanted to make sure that you and, and other and the, the public are clear about that. Um, so, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, and you know, I, I went directly to folks uh, online. Anyone um, uh, in person wish to make a comment? Go ahead. Uh, Steve. Steve Whitaker, uh, ever the contrarian. Uh, if we, while I recognize the health, potential health benefits of protecting others with a mask or protecting yourself with a mask, and I wear a mask when I go into a store, uh, I don't want to be told where I have to win. I want to use my own judgment. And if I'm too close to people who may or may not be safe, I will put on a mask. But this is like political correctness run amok. It's totally unenforceable, just like we can't enforce uh, our skateboards and bicycles on the sidewalk. We can't enforce our litter ordinance or our 
no idling ordinance. This is totally unenforceable. Uh, you got jurisdiction issues with the state buildings, whether the Capitol Police or the state, the city police are not going to go write tickets for masks. And the state's attorney's already said he's not going to prosecute any of these. So this is really just a, you know, an exercise in political correctness uh, to alleviate the encouragement of citizens to to police themselves and, and demonstrate consideration for each other. Um, the the nanny the nanny city instead of the nanny state. Uh, how are you going to deal with the folks that are living outdoors who are passing pipes around and passing beers around and refuse to wear masks and, and then become even more pariah than they already are treated? You know, you this is this is not an enforceable thing. It's it, you can do it. You can encourage it. That would be a better resolution. We utmost encourage people to wear masks in any public setting, but to mandate it and then have it unenforceable basically makes a, a, a fool's errand out of it. Um, Regarding the notice, uh, you're, you've heard from me for years that the website sucks. It's dysfunctional. It cannot, you know, Morgan couldn't find it. The, you, you finding the packet versus finding the agenda. If you want to put a link in every item of the agenda, rather than have the agenda open up another window, which then has some links to some sections, your website is dysfunctional. Replace it, find a new vendor, you know, but don't, just keep telling people they're wrong when they say they can't find something or they get a different year's, uh, you know, agenda to the homelessness task force or something. It's not their problem. Uh, reading, trying to read with a mask on, fogging glasses is, is, and if anyone's ever had any hearing issues and needs, most people rely on lip uh, to some degree to, uh, you know, distinguish consonants from vowels. And to basically, you got a lot of people saying, what'd you say, what'd you say, what'd you say, who aren't hard of hearing, but they rely subconsciously on visual cues. So I just think you're way overreaching in a, in a fool's errand. Thank you. Anyone else in person? Yeah. I am Eva Zaret. I'm a... I live in Plainfield, um, but I grew up in Montpelier. I'm a public health specialist um, in social and behavioral sciences. And I have to say, I believe that this is actually an exercise in human decency. And I hope that we wouldn't be looking at one another and making a judgment about whether or not that person is at risk just by looking at them on the outside. I think this is really important to institute a mask mandate. And I would recommend just striking that last bit about whether or not you're, um, around another person. Thanks. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Oh, go uh, ahead, just, Bill. Just had a couple of points of clarification about comments that were made by various people. Number one, the state legislature that created the enabling statute only um, restricted our ability to regulate indoors. <clears throat> so the comment about whether we should re regulate outdoor gatherings or sidewalks or anything like that is beyond the scope of the authority that's been granted to cities and towns. Um, we might want to think about if we're granting permits to a, an event that that becomes a condition of the permit. But in terms of uh, whether there's protests or any other gathering outside, that is beyond the scope of our ability. Secondly, um, whether you choose to leave the in the presence of others in or not, there's nothing to prevent a private business from enacting whichever uh, regulations that are stronger than this. So um, even before we were all to do this, there, there have been businesses which have required uh, masks and they can continue to do so and they can continue to have more stringent uh, regulations. Uh, and then lastly, um, as the mayor said, there's nothing in here about vaccinations. In fact, all it says is that these apply regardless of your vaccination status. Um, I see um, another couple of hands here. Uh, Lincoln Earl Centers, go ahead. Yes, hi, this is Lincoln. Uh, I live in Montpelier. And I just had a, a question um, to sort of throw out for consideration, which is related to the 
for whoever there's tension between public health and, and personal choice, um, Diane mentioned the efficacy of masks and how dentists and uh, medical professionals are wearing masks. And, and that specifically brings up the point that in those situations, one party is wearing a mask, not both parties. And um, just to put the point out there that there is, there's a difference between mandating that everybody have the same perspective and asking people to not um, do their personal choice that I see lots of people around that have heavy duty masks and, and are obviously concerned and, and they're protecting themselves with, with heavier duty masks. And I just wonder if it has been discussed that that balance between, um, you know, if, if a dentist is literally working in somebody's mouth, obviously they're not unmasked or that they're not masked, sorry. Uh, and yet we're, we are aware of the fact that that is protective for the wearer. And nobody, of course, is going to be asking anybody not to wear a mask that chooses to wear a mask. So I just bring that up as a, as a point of consideration. Great. Thank you. Uh, anyone else uh, wish to make a comment, either in person or online? Uh, yeah, uh, so uh, Tracy, um, generally we, you know, try to avoid um, uh, multiple comments, but if you have something quick to add, that would be okay. I just wanted to add very quickly that uh, within the past week that uh, several scientific studies had come out uh, about the risk assessment between uh, one person wearing a mask and the different levels of the masks versus um, an N95 or cloth mask or just surgical masks that um, allow for uh, air to go around the mask and versus if both people are wearing or if an individual is wearing and the risk assessment for that. And it was very clear that both people wearing the masks were better. And if the counts would like, I can email uh, the, the links to those actual scientific articles. So yes, it has been addressed in the scientific community. Thank you. And I would certainly welcome any uh, email about uh, those studies. Thank you. Uh, Phyllis Rubenstein, go ahead. Thank you, and uh, Phyllis Rubenstein from Montpelier. Just to, first of all, I'm fully in favor of having a mask mandate in all uh, public spaces as you've discussed. And the issue of the dental office. I have been to the dentist many times this year. My dentist's office, not only are they wearing double masks and a clear face shield, they're also in, um, I don't know what, what it's called. They, they put on the clothing, um, the uh, gear. So they are totally geared up and the patient has the mask on and uh, is wearing a mask until the patient is actually worked on. And in my dentist's office, she uh, takes the uh, oxygen level, a temperature. So it's, they are extremely cautious. And uh, the patient has the mask off only for the period of time where the work is actually being done. I've, I found, uh, so, and I, I um, think that it's important for everyone to wear masks and going to a dental office when you need to have work done is an exception. The same way if you're eating in a restaurant, you take your mask off while you're eating. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, go ahead. Uh, I know we had uh, more council comments. I'm gonna to go to, to Lauren who had their, her hand up earlier and then, and then to Jay, go ahead, Lauren. Sure, thanks. Um, so, I mean, first of all, I've become convinced that we could remove the phrase in the presence of others. So I recommend we do that. I think that makes a lot of sense. So thanks for everyone's feedback. Um, I would just echo the disappointment that the governor has been unwilling to put in a statewide mask mandate, punting it to local officials, but I agree we should move forward with this tonight. I think there's good data from other states with mask mandates that these increase the use of masks, um, even recognizing enforcement challenges and everything. 
Um, you know, I think we've consistently tried to follow the science when we put the mandate in earlier than the state, when we removed it, we were following the science, when we put it in place for the city uh, buildings a couple months ago. Um, so I think, you know, we're doing our best trying to follow the science and the CDC right now is very clear that if you have transmission at the levels that we have, that they urge communities to have indoor mask mandates. Um, you know, one speaker noted another consideration about health system capacity is another factor that the CDC um, urges communities to look at when considering mask mandates. And right now, you know, we're seeing the articles about how strained our ICUs are, you know, there's lack of beds, um, you know, and the stress this is putting on our healthcare workers. And thank you to all of them. Um, thanks to all of you who are in there. I mean, how it's been so rough. So so much appreciation and you know as somebody noted that everyone with every kind of health condition right now is more at risk if our healthcare system is strained in all these ways so i think this is the least we can be doing for each other to you know be wearing masks to require them so i will be supporting this tonight uh, go ahead jay so quickly i i, um, I want to echo what lauren said and uh, particularly about the um what I think is a lack of statewide leadership in terms of um, uh, having a statewide mask mandate and, and how that reduces efficacy of, of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, so I really appreciate that. And also, I just wanted to um, add in one point of, of, of data, which is I um, spoke with folks from Montpelier Live a couple of days ago, reached out to them to see if there was a sense general sense for at least downtown businesses about um, how we might approach that. And and it, while it was an informal survey, the, the sense was pretty much at least two to one that they were in favor of, of a mandate. So it's not um, uh, not total consensus, you know, not every business is built the same, but there it sounds like there's strong support from our downtown business community around this. So thanks. Great. Can I make it very brief? It's very brief, yes. Very brief. Uh, I would ask you, encourage you to think about using your health officer authority and even some of our loan funds, whatever, to, to offer air cleaning devices. Make sure air cleaning devices, that would be a whole lot more effective than masks in varying businesses. That air cleaning devices, it took a long time to get them into this room. But that would be a much more effective than an unenforceable mask mandate. So, thank you. All right, uh, Bill, go ahead. Two, two more comments. I don't want to drag this out too much longer. A point about enforcement's been made a couple times. I'd note that the statute that the state passed does allow for fines up to eight hundred dollars for violations. We opted not to include that um, for trying to give people. Mm -hmm. The opportunity to do the right thing um, and also because of uh, demands upon our police and others we didn't feel like that was going to be the kind of uh, policing we wanted but i would note that um, also under the statute this has to be re-upped after 45 days and every 30 days so those are the kinds of provisions that could be included in the future if we felt enforcement was necessary i would hope we wouldn't have to do that and secondly, just broadly, um, this is a more of a professional perspective um, from a higher level, the issue of pu public choice versus public safety and public health. I just note that all of us every day um, give up public choice in, in, in lieu of public safety when we stop at a stop sign, when we stop at a red light, when people have to go outside to smoke in a restaurant. These are all uh, because they can't smoke in restaurants. Uh, any number of things that government mandates for the public good um, to protect all of us. And um, those, for whatever reason, don't seem to get people riled up over their rights. And this does, and I don't understand it. Uh, the, it so from my perspective, obviously you're the policy making board, but the, the science is crystal clear. And um, if this is a public health issue and it's not a particularly uh, difficult ask, or inconvenient ask to ask of people. All right, um, I think we are probably ready to um, have some kind of a motion, I imagine. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I'll move to adopt the emergency order with the proposed changes tonight, including the last line strikers. 
Lauren said there at the end. Right. So it does not include no. the <laughs> in the presence of others. That's perfectly fair. So just to be clear for the record, yeah. since it's, we had a lot of conversation, the heading that says wearing face coverings would say wearing face coverings required indoors inside any building that is open to the public within Montpelier city limits. And then under the requirement to wear face covering, it would say effective immediately any person, whether an employee, a customer, or a visitor who enters a public or privately owned business, a privately owned building that is open to the public must wear face coverings, da 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 da. Those are the only two yeah. changes. I think that's right. Uh, second, okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, and I just um, want to note that I am um, very grateful uh, for for everyone who um, participated in the discussion. And I just want to note that I, I think this was the the right choice for us to make. Uh, and you know, in light that not every community is making this choice, um, so I think we're um, I think we're we're doing the right thing for for us. Um, all right, and so now we're on to a COVID OSHA policy that is particular to this. To, uh, right. So this within, this relates yeah. only to city employees. OSHA has issued a regulation for um, all employers with over 100 employees, which is us, mm -hmm. that by January 4, uh, we have to have a policy in place relating to vaccinations and or testing. And uh, I know that's in court, but we are proceeding um, to follow the regulation. Um, Essentially, the choices that we are given in this is to either mandate vaccinations for all employees or to uh, require those employees who are not vaccinated to wear masks at all times other than eating and again when six feet apart from someone and to be tested on a regular basis, at least weekly. Um, so this is this is a long policy, but essentially that's what it is saying uh, that it is. Uh, that you do not have to be vaccinated, but you do need to be masked and regularly tested, and that you, um, all employees must show evidence of their vaccine status in order to fall into one of, if you don't present your vaccine card, you must do the testing. And it goes on to talk about how this all works. Um, and we have shared this with employees. We've got some uh, similar comments to what we received tonight about choice. And uh, again, and we've responded similarly. Uh, we have about 95% of our full-time employees are vaccinated, so it's a small number that would fall uh, under the testing requirements, but uh, I would certainly urge you to pass this. We have to pass one or the other um, by January 4. Any comments on this? Uh, go ahead, Jeff. I move that we adopt the policy as presented. I'll second it. Okay, motion and a second. Any comments? Um, either from council or the public in person or online. No comments. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for bringing this up. Uh, all right, so we are up to um, a presentation or update from uh, the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think there's folks uh, here for that. Um, so I would um, welcome you up to this table. Yeah, yeah, come on, come on. Have a seat. And to be fair, you're going to want to pull that microphone close and. Yeah. Um, hey. And do you have a, a presentation you want to project? No, we'll just be speaking tonight. Okay. Just real great. quick, so that we'll actually great. show you to people. Oh, great. There we go. <laughs> okay. Welcome. And if you'd also uh, introduce yourselves. Sure. Can you all hear me? Yes. Is uh, that maybe? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So I just introduced myself, but I'm Eva Zaret. I'm a public health specialist at Central Vermont Medical Center and a project coordinator for the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition backed by the hospital. This is Dr. Mark Detman. He's an ER physician at CVMC and also the project director at the coalition. And this is Olivia LeClaire. She's an AmeriCorps VISTA serving with us this year as a rural community organizer. Yeah, please do. <laughs> First of all, as a, a practicing ER doctor, 
I'm going to go work to work tomorrow morning, and I'm going to go to work tomorrow morning feeling really good about what you all just did. That was um, sensible, science-based, and a very thoughtful conversation and resolution. So I really appreciate it. It's a hellish world out there or in there. Um, I also just want to mention, you're going to hear about our coalition's work tonight in the area of substance use disorders. Um, but I want you all to be aware that our emergency department, that is your community's emergency department, is doing some extraordinarily progressive and proactive things for people with alcohol and drug problems. Um, anyone can walk into our ER any time of day, 24-7, and get some real help that starts to get them onto a path for recovery. And they can come in in crisis, or they can just come in walking and say, I need some help. So that's an extraordinary transition. It's unusual to find in any hospital in this country. And really proud to have that here. Uh, and you'll, you'll hear more about the work we're doing that Eva and Olivia are going to present. So thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Mark. Um, uh, Mayor Watson, we've had the pleasure of speaking with you and introducing ourselves previously. And we're really excited to be in front of the whole council tonight to uh, um, introduce you to our substance use coalition backed by the hospital and to talk to you about ways that we can assist Montpelier and help Montpelier residents who are struggling with their substance use or have an addiction to get into treatment, which is available and on the road to recovery, but also to talk about primary prevention efforts so that we can delay or mitigate uh, substance use in youth and hope that they don't end up in that situation later in their lives. And one of the ways that we'd like to do that that we'll talk to you about uh, in a minute a little bit more is through um, a, a broader community forum where we would take this conversation um, to the community that we'll be having here tonight and expand on some of these points. Um, but first, you should hear a little bit more about who we are, and I'll turn it over to Olivia. Yeah, so a little bit about us. Um, there are many really great nonprofits and agencies here in Central Vermont that work in the substance abuse realm, including primary prevention, treatment, recovery, and harm reduction, um, including Ann Gilbert from Central Vermont New Directions, who you, many of you may know. She's actually on Zoom here tonight. Um, she's our coalition's primary prevention partner. And there, we meet monthly, um, and really great initiatives have come from these groups of organizations meeting together. Yeah, so um, the coalition has been working together since I think 2015, but in 2020 they were awarded, uh, the coalition and the hospital was awarded a um, three-year federal grant to address the opioid crisis in particular in central Vermont, including rural central Vermont. So some of our work is taking place in Barrie and Montpelier, but also out into places like Worcester and um, down into uh, northern Orange County, like Washington and Orange. Um, so we're reaching out into all of the small communities. And the opioid crisis, as everyone knows, has always been serious, but it is currently at a level that the country and the state and central Vermont and Montpelier have never seen before. Um, I have some stats here. The most recent data that we have available to us from the health department goes through August of this past year. Uh, statewide, 129 people have died so far. At the same time last year, 104 people have died and fewer the year before and fewer the year before. So the deaths are increasing every year. Here in Montpelier, through those official numbers, and they, they lag about eight weeks from the health department, there haven't been any official deaths reported, uh, although we've heard tonight that anecdotally, there are some that may end up being officially declared later as data becomes available to us. But the point is that it doesn't matter what the life conditions were that led to somebody using substances and developing an, ad an addiction. At that point, it becomes a medical condition. And we need people to know that there are treatments available that are really effective, that we can help them get into, that will bring them to the road to recovery, but that it's not enough to just address this issue. We have to work with our kids to make sure that we're implementing primary prevention activities that are going to just keep them from even beginning on that road um, in the first place. And we have a lot of ideas and we have the resources to help make this happen. And as we know, kids are struggling right now during COVID with their mental health. 
and mental health and substance use often go hand in hand. And so we think that although things are really difficult right now and working with schools who are so swamped is so hard, this is such a critical time that we really need to be doing something. So like I said, we have the ideas and we have the resources. Some of these include work directly in schools, like training school nurses to be able to do screenings, to assess whether or not a child might be at risk and be able to direct them to some resources. But it also means building a community where kids feel that they are, that they matter to their community and that they're busy doing things that bring them joy. We were really happy to hear that uh, this hub idea that's coming um, that might be bringing some sort of sports and physical activity that kids can get involved in. But we also want to make sure that there's space for kids that are not into sports to be engaged, um, you know, after school, whether that's a maker space or even working after school in a job. So these kinds of things are evidence based. They've been replicated in other countries like Iceland, which in some ways not so different from Vermont. Um, and we can help make these things happen. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Olivia now, who's going to talk a little bit more about our ask about a community forum, because we really feel that going to each community and understanding what their priorities are is going to be critical for any of these to really be successful. Yeah, so um, our request for tonight is that we'd really like to have some time with your community um, to start conversations about substance use and building a healthy community. Um, we're actually doing this community forum idea in Northfield in January. It's going to be virtual and in person, and it's going to be held at um, the library community room. And so this will be the first of many that we plan to do around the county. Um, so however something like this gets set up, we plan to bring in experts to talk about the um, substance use and um, ways that we can also help shape initiatives that people in your community want to be involved in and help out with. Um, so our questions for you are really how you see something like this taking place in Montpelier, um, whether where it is and how this can really become a reality. We really would like to have this um, in mid-February, that's like, if that's possible, um, and we'd be happy to answer any other questions or be pointed to a point of contact person who could help us um, with this project. But yeah, that's our thoughts. <laughs> thoughts or questions go ahead Jennifer have you all um, reached out to any of the local nonprofits that are working with um, community members that may be in your demographic can you repeat that last part you said yeah have you re reached out to any um, nonprofits that are local that are working with community members that may be falling into this demographic for you? Have you reached out to any yet? Yes, we have a membership of about 30 local nonprofits in our coalition. So if you've heard of them, they're likely a part of the Central Vermont Prevention Coalition and have been for years. Yeah. And it's span. Yeah, yeah, so what what uh, Dr. Detman is saying is that in addition to um, you know, the people that work in treatment um, and recovery, like the Turning Point Center, we have Vermont Cares, who's harm reduction focused, but we also have representation from Montpelier Police Department, um, Good Samaritan, uh, the Youth Services Bureau. Have you um, reached out to Downstreet? Downstreet is a member okay, of our coalition, actually. And the Family Center? And the Family Center, right, that's yep. where I work. That's where I was <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we, um, we have a, a really broad representation, which is really unique for a coalition like ours um, and critical because that's the only way that we can make sure that people don't fall through the cracks as if we're building up the connections between uh, <clears throat> sectors that are often siloed. Did you want to add something? Okay. okay and we have a whole list of all, we should provide that to you. And it's it should be listed on the one pager that we sent out, all the logos are listed. So. Um, Yes. So I, I'd just say on behalf of our staff that we'd be happy to assist with this. Um, we're always, you know, this is a high priority for us, as you mentioned, the police department, and I know our, our, you know, our EMTs work with this community a lot, unfortunately, mm -hmm. at the sad end of that a lot of the times. Uh, and so we, uh, I'm not sure, you could contact me or Cameron Niedermeyer, assistant manager. We, we'll do a team meeting tomorrow morning after this meeting and debrief, but we'd be happy to help set that up. I know 
our community justice center in the past has helped do these kinds of forums. Um, so by all means, we can help, you know, partner with you to put something like this on in the community. To figure fantastic. out where and when and who and all that. Thank you so much. They're also a member of our coalition. The justice center. <laughs> That's good to know. <laughs> yeah, so just go to them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Connor. Thanks so much for the good work uh, you folks do. It's really good to hear about it. Um, what, what, one way you may want to go is we're trying to like sort of stay away from just like posting something on front porch forum and hoping that good things happen, you know. So what we did was the mayor's initiative established the capital area uh, neighborhoods there, which have organizers embedded in each neighborhood in Montpelier. So it would definitely be worth sitting down with them because they have their own email lists. You know, I think they've even been known to do some canvassing and they might have some good ideas uh, of their own to help generate turnout for that. So we can put you in touch with them. That's the great. That. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, also, I don't know if the schools are if you're interacting with the schools very much. Um, anyway, I've, I've, I have contacts I feel like I can um, connect you with folks at the school who would be pertinent <laughs> to the topic. Um, but also, I just want to come back to the point that you made about uh, the work that's been done in Iceland. Um, I've done some reading about the, the work there in terms of prevention and have been very impressed um, with the results, really, but also, um, you know, the, the logical, uh, I guess it, it seems logical in hindsight, you know, like, oh, right, of course, of course, you'd want to engage students in, um, in the, you know, these kind of alternate, you know, stress relieving um, activities. And so like, how can we, as, I mean, speaking as a teacher also, like, how can we be uh, providing those kinds of opportunities uh, for, for students? Um, Anyway, something that I'm I'm very interested in as well. So thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts or comments? So we really appreciate the support and we'll be reaching out for some contact information and next steps. Great. Super. Right. Thank Thanks. you so much. Yeah, thank you. For sure. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so next on our agenda is uh, the um, water resource recovery facility. Um, I am guessing that we should probably take a break now. Sorry. Because <laughs> um, we would normally be taking a break at around 830. Um, and I think this conversation may last longer than that. So um, maybe. Uh, anyway, so let's let's take a, a 10 minute break. It's 810 right now. We'll be back at 820. And we'll jump in uh, with the water resource recovery facility presentation, which I am looking forward to. So Great, thank you. It is uh, 821 here, so we're coming back. Oh, and there's Jack, okay. Okay, so we are coming back from our break, uh, jumping in with the water resource recovery facility presentation on um, solids drying. Uh, so welcome. Uh, uh, introduce yourselves and take it away. Sure, thank you. Uh, my name is Kurt. And my right hand is Cox. He's the chief operator of the Water Resource Recovery Facility. And on my left is uh, uh, Colin O'Brien. He is the project manager for the engineering firm we've been working with, Brown and Caldwell, uh, to develop this project. Um, so tonight we're here to talk about the wastewater or water resource facility phase two, just to refresh everyone's memory. Uh, the phase one project um, was completed in June of, last, of this year. Uh, so it's been about six months of, um, of operating the facility with, our, with the upgraded equipment. Uh, as part of that project, the, um, the plant now has the ability to take in high strength organic waste and uh, as a result of the high strength organic waste we are making in the digester improvements the equipment improvements at the plant we're making a lot more methane so probably a lot of folks may have uh, noticed the flare off the interstate so a lot of times you know when it's particularly in the summer months we are you know, flaring that methane um, these two projects is really looking at a beneficial use to capture that methane and utilize it we are we are utilizing the methane in the winter months for heating the buildings um, but there is the summer month offset, which um, currently, which is really the uh, 
project is um, look at fully utilizing uh, that methane we're producing. So just an overview of the question I have for tonight. First is the biosol. Why this is. It's just temperamental. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, while we're paused here, I don't think the presentation is going through to the scene. No, it's not coming up. So I'm not really sure. Actually, I'm not sure if that. Yeah, I'll just hit share screen. Oh, you get a permission. Sorry, Kurt. Now you got to go back to your. Oh, there are your go. many layers. Oh, we got it. Okay. Uh, so items for discussion tonight is the biosol dryer, which you mentioned, um, the benefits of that project, um, other plant upgrades that are needed currently, um, the cost estimates for upgrades at the plant, opportunities for funding, and a review of the combined heat and power alternative project for um, utilizing the methane. So that I'm going to turn it over to Colin. Stand up and talk if that works. Hi, everybody. Like Kurt said, I'm Colin O'Brien. I'm the project manager. I work with a consulting firm called Brown and Caldwell. I work here in Vermont, New England, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire. Um, I've worked with staff on the council and the member for having me this evening, as well as the public, to join us. I'm going to go through a few portions of more of the technical content here, so I will not try to dive deeply into the details but keep it as a level so that everybody can be informed about what we're talking about here. And before I do that, I do just wanna commend the city staff, the DPW staff working through this project have been very collaborative and you should be proud of the water resource recovery facility that you guys own and operate. With that, there were three technologies that we looked at as part of this evaluation, a rotary drum dryer, a belt dryer, and a paddle dryer. So these are all various different technologies of varying cost up there and on the on the screen share you'll see there's some data regarding some of their minimum throughput which comes into play here at montpelier some of these technologies cannot handle the small amounts of sludge that sometimes get generated here they're mainly larger intended for larger municipalities um, for example, the MWRA in Boston has drum dryers, so that is not something that we would thoroughly consider here in Montpelier. Uh, what we did land on, mainly for its efficiencies, its safeties, and if you see on the bottom those pictures, those pictures are of what we call Class A products. So that's what comes out of the dryer. That's your finished product. Um, we landed on an indirect fired uh, belt dryer as our solution. And the main reason as we're looking at the three of these options up here is as Kurt noted, is we're trying to utilize excess methane that's being uh, generated at the WRRF. So with that, we also needed to select the technology that's capable of utilizing that methane or what you'll see indirectly hot water from methane consumption in the safest manner in the most efficient manner to help meet you know, 2030 sustainability goals. You wanna to go to the next slide, Kurt? So as I mentioned, the alternative that we ended up lying on was an indirect hot water belt dryer. Uh, staff and myself did go visit uh, installed locations in the United States. A big thing for me is uh, if we're gonna recommend a technology, if we're even gonna consider it, we really need to go and see it so that the people that are gonna be operating this and dealing with it day in and day out are comfortable with it and it's been established as a proven technology. One really important thing for the WRRF staff was that we could run this 
automated. The rest of the plant is very automated. So they can dewater your sludge currently without anybody being there. The operators have the avail availability to log into a laptop and view the plant's current operations. That was very important so that we did not have a huge impact on staffing with whatever technology is considered. The third priority was to produce a Class A product. Now, Class A product, in terms of EPA, allows this for beneficial reuse as an option. It does not mandate that that is how the sludge has to be handled, but it puts you into that category, which it, it opens your uses for managing the slugs. Uh, we also wanted to utilize existing hot water boilers for primary loop. So as Kurt talked about, I'm going to go back to that. We want to reuse excess methane. The easiest, safest way to do that is low temperature hot water boilers, which the plant already has several of. So we had come up in concept with some ways that we can modify existing hot water loops. And when I say hot water, I'm talking less than 220 degrees F that would be able to generate the heat and allow for the drying process to occur. Um, it had the lowest operational complexity of all the options that we went to, which made sense, being that some of the technologies are intended for much larger facilities. And we were able to size the unit in the footprint that I'm going to show out on the next slides for 25 wet tons per day. And what that means is that is the maximum peak solids loading that we see at the plant. So essentially, we wanted to make sure something could be sized to fit to meet all your sludge needs on the site with the constraints that we have. And one other benefit, uh, as I kind of already mentioned, is we're going to replace one of the existing oil burners with a combination oil methane. So that was a project benefit as well. Kurt, the next slide. So this is what the layout looks like on the left hand side of the page, that red box that denotes uh, where the dryer building is going to be. You'll see there's an electrical room in there. We also had to accommodate uh, between the DPW building and this back side of the plant here, allowance for a vac truck to get in there to be able to maintain the existing infrastructure that you recently installed under the phase one project. Under note two, I believe, it, it denotes the cake pump and other items that we're trying to reuse existing space within the dewatering building. So we need to figure out and what we did figure out is how to convey cake from your existing assets to this new facility. And there is space in the existing dewatering room to accommodate that. And then bullet, the bullet on the right is describing where the new hot water dual fuel boiler will be installed to replace and, and repurpose where an existing dual fuel boiler is. Can I ask a question? Um, yes. Cake to me means something else. Okay, not, so not birthday cake, unfortunately, because if the treatment plant made that, we would have no issues. So cake is what we refer to as solids. They're dewatered, take the water out, that are less than 50% total solids. So Chris can run tests in his lab to determine the percent solids in it. So we call cake the dewatered product. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other technical items that I might have <laughs> underexplained? <laughs> okay. I'll turn it back to Chris. As Kurt mentioned, my name is Chris Cox, Chief Operator, uh, Water Resource Recovery Facility. I'm going to touch on the project benefits. Uh, the goal is to sell this product right from the start. We're targeting a 30 mile radius. Initially, we will use a third party resource management company uh, to manage the dried product. If a robust enough market for the material is established, the city will eventually be able to manage their own product and, and reduce costs uh, further. Another benefit is reduced solids disposal volume and associated reduction in trucking. Currently, we manage roughly 3,800 tons of, of solids. Uh, with the dryer, we'll reduce that down to about 1,300 tons to manage. That will reduce yearly by 75% and reduce CO2, emit, CO2 emissions excuse me, from associated trucking by 78%. The dryer creates a Class A biosolids, as Colin had mentioned, that has expanded alternate, alternative, uh, alternatives for beneficial use. Soil amendment is one, it adds nutrients and carbon um, and is used as a greenhouse gas storage. 
as you put the carbon into the into the soil. Um, land restoration examples, mine rec reclamation and Superfund sites. And currently A and R and DOT are working on getting approval for the use of state and private corp, uh, companies to use as a manufactured topsoil. It also provides a balanced utiliz utilization of methane our demand for drying during lower heating demand months. Solids from increased municipal uh, sludge receiving during the summer and shoulder months when the facility and digester heating demands are at their lowest. In other words, there will be an increased demand for biogas to dry up. There will be an increased demand for biogas to dry biosolids during the warmer months, um, minimizing flaring. Dewatering the biosolids, or excuse me, drying the biosolids will provide a step in to potential PFOS destruction paralysis. Biosolids first need to be dried before the paralysis process can strip out PFOS compounds from the solid byproduct. This dryer aligns with core functions of the resource recovery facility, recovering renewable resources out of the waste stream and utilizing those resources for beneficial reuse. We're talking about biogas usage and, and, and class A biosolids for beneficial reuse. Additionally, um, not on here as a, a bullet point, but it will also reduce the generation of landfill leachate. We would stop trucking dewatered sludge that is 75% water to the landfill. Few of the project benefits. Now on to the next slide, we have additional facility upgrades and, and, and challenges. Odor issues have increased since the completion of the phase one project. Uh, the city is under directive from DEC to take correct actions. Potential causes are increased septage and high strength waste receiving, along with the addition of air handling in the dewatering building since the completion of phase one. The, hit, the city has been in discussion with the ESG concerning odor, odor issues, and DPW will be proposing another engineering amendment with Brown and Caldwell to reevaluate, or to, excuse me, to evaluate the facility's odor profile and provide a solution. Secondary clarifiers um, are the last of the aging infrastructure improvements that need to be addressed. It, it was not addressed in the phase one project. Essential to the wastewater treatment process, the two secondary clarifiers were installed in 1978, over 40 years ago, and they're well beyond their expected useful life. It is about 50%. We're projecting roughly 80% loading. Um, that means that there'll be minimal oil use, minimal fuel use required at pro projected loadings. Working with Brown and Caldwell, DPW is confident that by reducing air exchanges in the dewatering building through the use of an odor control system, the building's heating demands in the winter will be lowered enough so as not to need supplemental fuel oil. Also, as a secondary benefit, odor control is, oh, excuse me, also a secondary benefit is odor control on a building suspected of contributing to the recent increase of odor at the facility. Another uh, talking about challenges, we're, we're also very um, considerate of high in, in inflation, as you are all aware of, and cost escalations in the current market. And and as one more pro, uh, challenge, excuse me, is the addition of a septage storage, the additional septage storage needed for selected dryer size. Um, currently, the facility has a 50,000 gallon septage holding tank and a 50,000 gallon leachate holding tank that are side by side. The dryer that is uh, the dryer project will create the need for additional septage storage to level out receiving peaks during the day and to avoid the need to purchase a larger dryer with higher throughput. Uh, it will require an in-house project that can be done by DPW uh, to combine the septage and leachate receiving tanks together to double the size of the storage to 100,000 gallons. And there is additional tankage on site that can be used for leachate receiving. All right, thank you, Chris.
Uh, so now into the economics first on the dryer itself. So on projects like this, um, we often look to uh, the payback period of the equipment purchased. So really, um, that, that is a combination of uh, so combination of the debt service, uh, the operating costs. So for the dryer, the operating costs are um, uh, disposal, uh, the disposal of the dried and solid material, um, and then also there will be times when the uh, dryer is down for maintenance. So we'll have uh, we anticipate some need for um, non-dried solid disposal fairly soon. Um, there's a we do have a fuel use carried in this estimate. Um, we, like Chris mentioned, uh, as part of the phase one project, um, in order to uh, bring the watering building up to code, we significantly increased the amount of times the air circulated from inside the building to outside the building. And as a part of that, that created a much uh, larger heating demand. Um, so this oil use is, is projected in the winter months, but if we are able to, which we do feel confident we will be, but uh, we haven't done the engineering yet to verify it. <clears throat> if we can reduce those air exchanges to, um, by connecting the dewatering equipment to odor control, uh, we don't think that this uh, oil use will actually be necessary. Um, and then there is an electrical demand. There's um, fans and pumps associated with uh, the drying process. Um, and then the maintenance fee will have some outside maintenance costs. Um, so if you uh, add all those up, we've got an air cost of the machine of about 30 and a um, debt of 10,000 approximately. Uh, the alternative is we don't do anything, and um, we have a number here, 889,000 for what we're looking at, um, solid disposal costs in, in 10 years, the mid, this, this project, this uh, equipment estimated the last 20 years. Midterm, we're expecting, you know, assuming that we pay market rates and fill um, either through the, the end of leaching or Casella potentially the monolithic treatment. Um, we're expecting that we'll pay market rate. So in 10 years with escalation, that rate is $191 per wet ton. Um, and it also um, calculates or uh, our full plant, the plant on that full receiving potential currently. The 3,600 wet tons we're managing now that Chris gave you, um, that's our current level, but once uh, we're fully receiving the capacity of the plant, we expect that to be 4,600 wet tons a year. So that 889 is a combination of the 191 multiplied by with the 4,600 wet tons, which we're expecting to hit in 10 years. So that's like the middle of the project. So you um, compare, the two, you know, summing up operational capital costs compared to what what will happen if we do nothing, what we expect will happen if we do nothing, um, we'll pay this equipment off in 18.9 years, 19 years roughly. Um, the items on the bottom are just sort of backed up to uh, how these numbers were derived. So moving on to the overall project costs, we really break this into three components. Uh, the first of the dryer, which I just discussed. The, uh, the capital cost construction bid is about 10.2 million. Um, and then with engineering, construction, and final design services, looking at $11.6 million project cost. The secondary clarifiers, our last piece of aging equipment, it's really needed for long term reliability of you know, good quality effluent, which we are we hold very important. It's a um, core function of the wastewater, water, water resource recovery facility. A project of total with engineering is 1.8 million, and then the odor control, as we discussed, uh, it is related to the dryer project um, with the air exchanges in the dewatering building. Um, this this assumes we have to replace the existing odor control at the facility, which is uh, which is where the receiving, where we take in the high strength waste. Very old piece of equipment it wasn't. It may not be appropriate. We're still evaluating I mean, what is associated with organic waste. It was, uh, at the time it was built, we did not take in that waste stream. 
this sort of tree uh, odors both um watering uh, issue so total project costs of uh, 16.4 million for the full upgrade uh so the other side of uh, now is a great time to do a big project. Um, there is more fun than I've ever seen in my 15 years here at the city. Uh, so we have been, uh, the officials at USD told them about a week ago. Um, they are really encouraging us. Uh, well, I wouldn't, I shouldn't say that. They, they said there is an opportunity for um, increased funding. <laughs> <laughs> through uh, a larger combined project um uh, the it sounds you know my understanding is that uh, you know the sort of the bigger the project you get a grant scaled to the size of the project so um there's a there's opportunities through usda which funded phase one um there's opportunities through the clean water state revolving loan fund which is uh, already providing 50% subsidy on the design work that we're doing. Um, we will be applying for, assuming this project goes forward, a pollution control grant, which also funded the phase one project, which is really geared around solids management. Uh, the, new, the new opportunity is the ARPA funding, um, which we've already gotten one grant for a CSO project. And this is also potentially a fund through program. And um, you know one <clears throat> one thing we uh, we were advised to consider is combining the actual ballot item on the bond uh, with the East State Street reconstruction project. And again, that would allow USDA to uh, look at the project as a single, um, <laughs> really a single project for fund uh, from a funding purpose. Obviously, there'd be separate construction contracts bid separately, but. Uh, again, there, there, you get the economy of scale. If we were to do that, we do have to, you know, run that by legal. I'm not sure um, if that's if that is allowable, but it's something we want to consider and just, you know, get uh, folks thinking about. Uh, so, just to recap on the other alternative for utilizing methane, back in May, we did a presentation to the council about. Opportunities, uh, the opportunity to do combined heat and power at the plant. Um, there was a project development uh, agreement with the uh, Energy Systems Group, who oversaw the Phase One project. Which, I, you know, I should note the Phase One project was very successful. You know, I think we we definitely made the right move on that. Um, you know, essentially that that project had really no rate impact outside of what was planned in the master plan, which, which was really just a three and a half million dollar project. Um, so, you know, just very happy with that project and uh, and that's setting us up to do you know something some great on the, on the back end through the methane production um <clears throat> some challenges with the chp is uh, it, uh, for the power sale agreement you have to have uh, 50 percent food waste um, we are hitting that right now we're about 60 percent but our digesters are not fully loaded we are we're about 50 percent capacity um our projections for the economics of of the drying project, the biosolids drying project um, estimates at an 80% capacity. Um, ESG has assured us that we will get there and soon. Um, the phase one project, um, the guarantee actually starts next week. So um, that guarantee is only a 60% loading on the organics, but um, you know, there's an incentive to for ESG even to just um, you know, maximize that to pay it to meet their guarantee as soon as possible, twenty-year term. If they if they exceed the guarantee levels on an annual basis, that can be used to count against future years. Um, so the, another challenge with the combined heat power, um, you know, at guarantee levels at that sixty percent loading, it did have a cash negative impact on the city. Um, it was roughly a you know three point four million dollar negative at sixty percent loading. At ninety percent loading of the digesters for high strength organic waste, there was a small um, or there was a financial upside of about six hundred thousand over the twenty year term. Another challenge is uh, there really is not a lot of grant opportunities for funding the CHP project. 
Um, if we were to move forward with this uh, and we wanted USDA funding at least, they would require a bidding, a, a rebid, even if we went with an energy service contractor in order to um, be considered for funding. But um, even with that, it is a challenge to uh, fund power production pro projects through USDA funds. Um, a benefit is this project is shovel ready. We have all the permits for CHP. We have the power sale agreement. We have um, the certificate of public good. Every all the legwork has been done for this project. Um, but uh, we're starting to run up against the timeline. So if if we're going to move forward and, and complete this project within the terms uh, of our power sale agreement, we really need to make a decision. You know, within you know by the end of the year, it would have to be complete and built by uh, December of 2023 in order to meet the power sale agreement terms. Um, so our recommendation is to proceed with final design on the biosolids dryer, the economics and um, long-term price stability and renewable opportunities that uh, presents. Um, we feel like that's the best, best, best project. Um, we also advise that we include the secondary clarifiers and the odor control. So, uh, which the odor control is a permit requirement, so um, really don't feel that's an, an option uh, not to do that. Um, so we recommend moving forward with final design on all three items, submitting uh, grant funding applications um, to all the available entities, and plan for bond warning, um, potentially with uh, combined with the East, East State Street ballot item pending legal review. Um, and uh, and move forward with these projects. And that is that is it. All right. So first, any questions uh, from council? And I think uh, I know there was at least one person from the public who had asked about. Uh, commenting or asking a question um, during this time, but uh, uh, we'll start start with the council here. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Kurt. Um, <clears throat> I'm looking at pages uh, eight to nine of the uh, you know the cost estimate pages are the uh, secondary clarify the cost of secondary clarifiers and odor control laid out in page on page nine are those included in the cost evaluations laid out on page eight or are those in addition correct no those are in addition so the you know the biosolids dryer was looked at independently as it's not um, it's not an essential function, whether through permit compliance or, you know, standard treatment plant reliability. And but you anticipate that uh, those both would be uh, needed or recommended, regardless of whether we go forward with the biosolids dryer. Program. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a few questions. Um, one just around the biosolids. So, like, it, is this cost estimate assuming that we're going to be selling and finding a useful market for the Class A? Like, which line item that was built into, if it is? Yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. So, we do have a, an actual cost proposal for uh, Class A management to a company called RMI. That's where these numbers were generated. Um, we're actually be paying disposal fees uh, initially. Uh, like Chris mentioned, I think we sort of establish the markets and, um, and the, there's discussion of uh, writing biosolids use into the VTRANS specs for uh, topsoil. Um, if that were to happen, which it seems fairly would not need uh, that service through RMI, but we did carry it for the 20 year term. So we're actually paying for the dried material disposal, which is okay. in the okay. Cheap. okay, thanks. 
I mean, because I know, like, I was talking to someone in Maine, and they're pursuing, like, a ban on land application of biosolids, and, like, I know I've heard that talked about in the committee rooms here and stuff, so I just want to make sure we're not locking ourselves into a price structure that's assuming we're going to have a profitable market, knowing the contamination issues and all of that, so it sounds like that's built into what we're seeing is not assuming a profit piece around that. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, one, just a couple other questions. Um, d does the intake of leachate volume, knowing obviously that's been a very active conversation, how do, would that play into it? So if, for example, we decided to stop taking it in a year, are we building this to a certain scale or somehow kind of getting locked into a structure um, that makes it more difficult to operate it at peak you know, operation or something because of the leachate being part of that system? Yeah, so leachate really has very minimal impact on the production of solids. It's primarily the high strength organic waste and the septage. Um, you know, we are uh, assuming that the city will not be taking leachate uh, through this, like Chris talked about, we, um, you know, unless it's treated from PFAS, as discussed as a, at an earlier meeting, uh, like Chris discussed, you know, we would likely, we would need to convert the existing leachate tank to septage storage in order to you know, um, fit the sizing of the belt dryer. Um, but we would do have an opportunity to repurpose an existing tank that's not currently used if the city were to decide to take treated leachate. Um, but yeah, there's there, there, as far as the sizing or solids production, there's really no impact from leachate. Great, thank you. Just a couple more. Um, sorry, I don't know. I have so many questions about our wonderful water resource recovery. <laughs> um, on the fossil fuel use, so I know that that was something that the Energy Advisory Committee had had some questions about. You know, so it sounds like there's like at least a hope that the system design would either like really minimize or eliminate the fossil fuel use, but there's some like it could result in some usage, I guess, just, I mean, are you feeling pretty confident knowing we've got our net zero goal and, and all of that? Like, I would just love to better understand like what a little bit more about that piece. Yeah, I'll pass this to Nicole, the technical. <laughs> So currently right now, the dewatering building, which is one of the larger structures at the plant, air changes, 12 air changes an hour. So if you think about that whole volume because of NFPA classifications for the equipment, the materials that's being handled in there, that building needs to get air changed 12 times an hour in the middle of December, January, February, March, I guess we'll say April too. That's a lot of heat for a big building. So what we looked at and what Kurt was presenting on is to meet those NFPA codes, we can classify that space to four changes in air per air changes per hour when it is unoccupied. So for the safety of operators, it's going to be 12 air changes an hour when it's being occupied. But for the majority of the evenings, right, which ends up being a larger portions of the day, and when the temperatures are colder, that building is unoccupied. So we did evaluate the difference in those heat loads, assuming the same building, no insulation improvements. And that's where we came up with the reduction that came to what that fuel consumption was, was the BTU value was equivalent of that. So that's why we put the placeholder in there, still saying that it was, but if the improvements are made, and to be honest with you, these are really just programming improvements. We don't need to build anything. It's changing the systems and how they operate. A little lengthy, sorry. Great, that's helpful. <laughs> Um, just two more, sorry. Uh, f f so filtration, uh, I'm just thinking about the potential opportunity, you know, knowing with the um, federal grant funding and their specific line item in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, I believe that was tied to PFAS contamination. I think Montpelier would have a great case to try to get a grant funded filtration system to address PFAS and other contaminants as the one property of leachate in the state right now. Would is there any either benefit or opportunity you see if we are doing a bigger bond to look into that? And or on the flip side, if it's not included here, are there any challenges? that this design and project creates to installing that, like with space constraints or anything else? Just just curious if this is like precluding or an opportunity around the filtration. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, so we've mentioned PFAS a few times already. So mm -hmm. PFAS is in two different states, as far as we know, at wastewater treatment plants or resource recovery facilities in the effluent and the biosolids. Mm -hmm. Right now, EPA and through our DEC does have regulations on what we need to do for that. So as far as filtration needs, there are technologies available. Uh, we would most likely at the site want to site it physically closer to where UV disinfection is. Essentially, after all of your clarification and treatment has happened, and the only thing left to do would be to take out the PFAS or remove the PFAS and then disinfect it to discharge it into the river. Um, I would say the unfortunate part when you ask about PFAS and you talk about biosolids is EPA has not sanctioned a method that is acceptable to test or treat biosolids. There's a lot of technologies out there currently that uh, have claims, but those aren't sanctioned, approved treatment disposal methods by EPA. But what a lot of the other communities in New England that we're working with, specifically, we've already talked about Maine too, that we're working with are seeing drying as a first step in this, right? This is a this is a volume reduction, a risk reduction. It doesn't eliminate it. I think we we can all fairly say that with drying, it doesn't remove the PFAS, but it eliminates and opens up to other options of how we can manage this risk. Because at the end of the day, the WRRF can't close the pipe off and not take in any more influent. So this would be considered a first step as far as the solids treatment of managing PFAS in the solids. So, so I guess my question, though, is we had heard from ANR and that there's and Casella that there's like technologies that could be installed on site. So this is like separate. I'm more thinking of the bigger, a bigger um, facility bond that is addressing other issues beyond the biosolids project. Is this making it harder to install? I don't know if it's reverse osmosis or like, is it is do you see any? No. There, OK, there's no. Yeah, let's like Colin mentioned them. Um, the dryer will be kind of on the solid stream of the plant, whereas the you know the liquid stream PFAS treatment would be sort of at the end. So as far as the physical location of it, of a, PFAS, of a filter <laughs> system, yeah, and, it, and it would not be in the same location. It wouldn't work where the dryer is going. And you're not proposing to do it now. I know you said cost was the biggest. <laughs> if I heard you I mean, correctly, to to not just we you know we hadn't. Um, we haven't planned to do that project um, at, at this time. Uh, we don't we don't know what the regulatory um, requirements will be. So it's you know it's kind of waiting to see uh, you know you know at what level do we have to treat to. It's a little bit hard to sort of size something. You know, obviously you'd want to get to zero, as close to zero as possible, but um, I just I feel like it's a little bit early. Uh, you know, personally, and but. Um, I mean, no, I'm not certainly if there is funding available and we could get a grant for it, you know, I would support that. It just might, you know, slow down um, the work that we just that we just discussed, you know, because it would be a, a kind of starting over for another evaluation through engineering. And there's, um, you know, three steps. There's preliminary engineering, final design and construction. Um, we're sort of through the majority of the preliminary engineering on these on these upgrades, but um, now, I certainly uh, am definitely open to looking into that uh, that funding option. Um, just one about the combined heat and power. Do you like is that saying, right, that the the core like negative to that is the economics, which is what interested you in looking at the biosolids. Like, if knowing, for example, that the state just adopted a climate action plan, they committed. A bunch of money to uh, climate action, like so. If funding did become available, it sounds like there's a lot more funding available on the biosolids right now. Um, I mean, is there any benefit to seeing what funding might be there, or I mean, do you just see this as just fundamentally a good way to go, regardless of um, kind of funding streams like I feel like originally it was like because of the funding issues around the electricity but if we've got the permitting and all of that I guess just like what's the case for doing this versus the electricity if there was a um, funding that became available although like recognizing we probably wouldn't know that for a number of months right uh, so part of it is the timeline right? so we um, we would kind of have to move forward relatively quickly in order to meet the deadlines for the power production um, but, but really, I think kind of what uh, 
what Chris and I like about the project is that we are uh, using a renewable energy to create, um, you know, a renewable material that is otherwise landfilled. Um, so, and, you know, the landfill, and we have one in Vermont that has a finite capacity, and we are sending, you know, 3,600 tons there every year. So, you know, I think if we, we think about, you know, what's, what is the best, you know, long-term benefit? Um, you know, the, the other thing is we're, you know, we're not really in, in the power business, it, it's a little bit of a stretch um, for us to, it would have to be completely uh, outsourced all the operations of the generator. It's not, it doesn't really tie into core function of wastewater treatment, like a like managing the solid stream from a plant. So um, I think it ties in better. I think um, you know, um, a long-term price variability, if land app application of, bi of wet, you know, biosolids class B or unclassified biosolids goes away, you know, the market for disposal could really skyrocket. So there's, you know, there's stability through doing a project like this where we're managing our own waste stream that has, you know, long-term benefits, I believe. Thank you. Very last one. <laughs> um, so knowing that the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act has like more, a ton of water project money, including things like this, if we approve move forward with a bond on this March, does that make it harder to get any of that grant money? Like if it's been approved by voters or are you still able to apply for a project that's like mid process? Yeah, so because we're going through um, the state um, uh, clean water state revolving loan fund, we expect that those that additional funding will be administered by the same program. And so we're following sort of the rules to be eligible for you know, all of this funding. It's essentially, we expect to have the same rules associated with it. As soon, as long as the money is released before you know, we go to construction, which is gonna be some time, this is probably, um, you know, two and a half, well, it's probably at least a year before we go to construction. The equipment takes a year to order, uh, or to, to be manufactured, um, so, you know, at least two and a half years before we'd be online with this project. So I do think we would be, you know, we'd be in good position for a future funding as well. Great. Thank you. Other questions from council? As opposed to like opinions. <laughs> we'll get to opinions in, in, in a little bit. Yes, Connor. Yeah, I, I think I asked last time, Kurt, but it, our understanding is this would trigger the responsible employer ordinance that we passed in 19 since it's over the 200. <clears throat> Yes, All right, I'm yep. a zealot on that thing. <laughs> uh, I have a question about, I, I think this is really uh, uh, maybe a question for later potentially, but I'm just thinking about our uh, debt service and our, our um, debt service policy and wondering where this puts us. I, I sort of assume that <clears throat> the uh even though it, this is a part of like the uh the water sewer fund generally uh that it would still count against us so to speak uh, in terms of debt service um and so i just wonder where this would i mean uh, it, it, um you know maybe we get a whole bunch of grants that's wonderful maybe we don't know if we've gotten the grants before we need to go to a bond and so that puts us at um, something like 12 million dollars if I am not mistaken um, you know based on the total project and the, what we have left over from the last one um, so anyway I'm just conscious of that and uh, know that that's something that I will want to revisit <laughs> when the time comes especially because I mean we were, we're looking at other bonds potentially as well, uh, you know, combine that with East State Street, uh, and and who knows what other all all else have bonds we we will decide to um, include. So um, I'm not sure that that's a question right now. I just want to raise it as a as a concern. That's all. So I, I can tell you we've given a lot of thought. To okay. that. You know, okay. we understand that concern, and um, I think we'll be prepared to talk about that in more detail. Uh, I don't know whether it's tonight when we do the dot bond section or next week when we when we get into these further. But um, 
it's definitely a concern. Uh, and I think the flip side of so the the good news is it's our policy. It's not a requirement, so we can we can try to make it work. But I think more importantly is you know, a project like this is large and then it's done for a long period of time. You know, it's, it doesn't necessarily, right. you know, parse out. So, we, you know, we one of the things I think we were going to look at is if we were to do this, then when, how long before we would sort of get back into compliance mm -hmm. and, you know, bond again and under the water and sewer part. So, we, we we've, I know Kelly's put a lot of work into this also while trying to finish the budget. So, we're <laughs> we're juggling a lot of things right now. So it's on your radar. It's on our radar, definitely. Okay. okay. Uh, great. Uh, other questions from council? Yeah, go ahead, Don. Well, I'm gathering from your recommendations, you would like <clears throat> to leave here today with a direction of either that we're moving forward with the intention of bonding with more information from staff. Is that correct? Um, yes, I mean, that would be helpful. We're, uh, in order to sort of be ready, if we want to, you know, go to construction next summer, um, you know, we need to move toward the final design. Um, so, Donna, if I could, I could jump in here. Um, I think obviously, if you if you're ready to support a bond right now, great. I mean, that would be. Um, I think the goal tonight was to introduce. You know, we owed you this presentation. We're actually going to we're going to do it in November. This was the follow up that we that we promised. Wanted to make sure you had a chance to digest the information, ask questions, understand the, the scope, size, scope, and scale. And we're meeting next week uh, for a budget workshop. And you know, later the, the next item, we're going to be going through the budget. We do have other bonds to talk about, so presumably we'll be giving some <clears throat> conversation then. Um, I guess, you know, sort of one of these things like if you really don't want to do this and it's that's clear, tell us now. <laughs> um, but I, I'm presuming that, you know, next week is fine. You know, we've got to still, it's still going to be warned in March. So um, through the through the budget process over the next couple of weeks, we can reach a decision. But we just want to make sure that this we've had a chance to really acquaint you with this right, in detail. So tonight, I could say I really support this and I want you and Kelly to do your magic to make it possible. <laughs> you certainly could okay. say that. Yes. <laughs> I, I mean, the recommended action is uh, provide authorization to proceed with final with project development. So. Yeah, you slipped that one. Proceed with Yeah, fair enough. Well, the, so the bond warning would need to happen in January for a March vote. So it's not a ton of time, but you know, yeah. it does not have to be decided tonight. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not any different than our other bonds. It's the same schedule. It's all our bonds. Okay, so. um, okay well, uh, any other questions, particularly um, from council? Okay, so I want to go to um, public. And so, Jeff, I see you've got your hand up. And then uh, Linda Berger, go ahead. Jeff or Linda Berger? I'm not sure who's. Oh, sorry. We'll uh, have Jeff go first here. Go ahead, Jeff. So you can hear me? Yes. Okay. So um, you guys, obviously, this is a huge project. And, and once again, I'm here before you talking about a huge project. But I want you to look at what is in our rear view mirror, which is the phase one of this project, which has been a pretty much uh, unqualified success. So we have some issues. There's no doubt we have issues, but we spent a lot of money to upgrade things that needed upgrading. And we've created a wonderful wastewater recovery, recovery facility that has now produced all this gas. And we got to figure out what to do with the gas. And I just, I, I need everyone to kind of understand that where we are now is not where we were five years ago. So we're, we're looking at what are we going to do with this incredible resource we have? And we have two basic choices, CHP and the dryer right now. I mean, we've, we've really looked at this and we've looked at it pretty carefully. I mean, I, I, I need to really 
give a shout out to Kurt and Chris for all their work on what they've done to research this. And I, I also have to give a shout out a little bit to MIAC um, because we, we have put their feet to the fire. We, we we're, we're constantly on them about what is this going to do in terms of either our net zero goals or our gas use. So our big concern with the dryer was when they came to us initially, they said they were going to use like almost 10,000 gallons of supplemental fuel. And we were like, no, that is not acceptable. So when they started reworking the whole dewatering building HVAC system and the, the whole they realized they, and that's what we said. We said, you must be able to save some money in the heating of the, of the plant to be able to make up for this. And I think they've convinced us they're right about that. And I'm sorry, I don't know the engineer who, who basically said, yeah, we're pretty confident of this. So now we're, MIAC, and I shouldn't, I should not be saying I'm speaking for MIAC because we have not met as a committee since we've been able to um, review all this information. Mm -hmm. But I feel personally pretty confident that it's going to be a minimal supplemental fuel use if there's any fuel use for the dryer. So we're looking at an almost perfect use where you're going to use all your gas, flare some, of course, in the summer. You're going to have to flare some in the summer because we're producing more. But it's, it's really an amazing project for me that's less than a 20-year payback. Under the worst case scenario, that's the 20-year payback is not even with the funding that Let's be honest, we all know people are throwing money at wastewater recovery facility projects right now. They're throwing money at it. I, uh, I'm just, uh, I, I know we can't guarantee this. Of course, it didn't come through for CHP, but with the, with the dryer, I feel pretty confident with Kurt and Chris's research that we are going to get some funding, which is going to reduce that 19 year payback. So I just want to say that personally, I am all for the dryer. I can't say that MIAC is all for the dryer um, because we haven't been able to meet as a committee. I do want to point out that you're saving over 40 tons of carbon per year reduced just on trucking to Coventry. Now I know the city some, sometimes doesn't uh, think that we should account for that, but I do. I, I think that's a big issue. So um, I actually think we need to be thinking about that. And the last thing I just wanted to say was the power sale agreement for the CHP. Now, Kurt didn't mention this, but when we last met, he told me that the, the food waste issue on the CHP contract was a big issue so that we might not even be entitled to those very advantageous CHP terms that we thought we were basing our CHP argument on. So if I'm wrong on that, Kurt, correct me, but that didn't get mentioned in the presentation. That's all I have. Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, all right, um, and we're going to go to uh, Linda Berger now. Go ahead. Hi. 
Um, I'm Linda Berger. I live in District 1. Um, I have five questions. The first is, when was Phase 1 of the Montpelier Water Resource Recovery Facility upgrade completed? Do you want to like, um, ask all your questions and then we can... Okay, two. Oh, is were okay? the... Sure. It's... Okay, sure. thank you. Absolutely. Second, were the phase one upgrades completed exclusively the ones in the bond placed before the public in November 2018, or were there additional upgrades added or substituted? Three, what were the originally planned phase two upgrades? Was um, resource recovery originally a part of the plan for the facility for the phase two upgrades? Four, when did the city receive Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation notice of directive action to address, address the odor issues? And what is the time frame for this order? And five, can a copy of this notice from the DEC be added to tonight's board, board packet and be made available to the public upon request? Yes. If, the answer to that is yes. Sorry, go ahead, Bill. The, the answer to number five is yes, happy to. And um, I thought we I meant to send you that today as per your request through Councilmember Hurl. I'll try to do it right now while we're talking. But we can also post it publicly. Um, and we may... I think Kurt probably Sorry, in the ahead. team will need to go. So I, th I think I wrote them down, Linda, if I may ask. So the first one was when was uh, phase one completed? The second yes. was, um, were the things that were voted on in 2018 part of phase one, were there changes or additions to the project, substitutions? Mm -hmm. uh, was energy recovery, I think, was part of phase, always going to be part of phase two? And then when did we get the DEC notice? And what is the time frame for, for addressing it? And then can the notice be posted? Is that the correct wording of your questions? I, um, I think number three was what were the originally planned phase two upgrades? Was resource recovery originally a part of the plan for the facility? Thank you. Okay, um, so I'll just go right through the list. So the first question was completion of phase one. The final completion of the project was June of 2021. Um, additional plant upgrades, um, you know, really I don't, uh, I don't believe a scope, uh, any significant scope was added to the phase one project. Um, there were some changes to the way things were designed, but as far as the overall scope, it was um, relatively consistent to um, uh, what was originally planned. Can I, Kurt, can um, I ask, can I interrupt yeah. for a question? So sure. solid, solids management in terms of the way it's, it's currently being envisioned was an original part of the plan? That's correct. So um, we use what's called screw presses for dewatering the solids, and that was in the original scope of the phase one project. Thank you. Um, as far as phase two, uh, we had uh, the city initially had, or through ESG Energy Systems Group, our consultant, um, they did a high level evaluations, uh, evaluation of alternatives for utilizing the methane. And at that time, CHP was identified as um, the best alternative. And uh, that was sort of envisioned, you know, even, if, you know, they originally we had considered combining um, the CHP project with the phase one. Um, later, we decided, as um, our city staff recommended, that we sort of wait and see where our levels of methane production were. Um, and keep those projects separate. But um, initially, it was planned for a power production phase two project. Um, for the uh, notice of alleged violation on the odor at the plant, notice was issued on November 5th of 2021. And um, there are a three uh, compliance items, well, really four. Uh, the first item is to take possible actions to control odors from the plant. Um, right now, uh, we are looking into um, trying to uh, increase the performance of the existing biofilter, which deals with uh, the receiving area. That's really our only odor control system at the plant currently. So, uh, you know, we've been in, cons in uh, discussions with the vendor, trying to get recommendations on what we can do to uh, improve that unit. 
Uh, the second item is uh, by November 15th, we, we were required to provide a written response of receipt of the notice, which we did. Um, by January, uh, well, I should mention as part of that written response, we did ask for um, an extension of the engineering evaluation, um, primarily because uh, we want to uh, sample, um, you know, part of the process to evaluate the odors is to take samples throughout the plant to get a profile of the odors being generated. And in the summer months is when um, we take in a lot more waste, and partic particularly on septage. So we have asked them to provide us um, some extra time. We did not have a written um, response from the state yet, but I did get a verbal that they were willing to do that. So we're still waiting on a final confirmation. Um, by January 1st, we need to retain services of a uh, qualified consultant. We are proposing to use Brown and Caldwell. We expect to have a proposal to city council on that evaluation, um, you know, hopefully in the next few weeks. Um, and as part of that evaluation, recommendations and timelines to mitigate odors uh, need to be uh, provided. And then March 1st, 2022, this is the, um, you know, the uh, deadline we're asking to extend in order to do the evaluation in the summer months. Um, by March 1st, 2022, two copies of the consultant's evaluations and recommendations need to be submitted to, um, to the agency. And as Bill mentioned, item five, we're happy to provide uh, a copy of this notice. Just want to check in, um, Linda, any follow-up um, you have to any of that? No, this is helpful information. Okay. Thank you. Great. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, any other public comments, uh, either in person or in on online? Go ahead. Uh, Stephen Whitaker. Uh, I would like to just be explicitly clear that the economics or understand that the economics of the drying investment are in no way uh, tied to the continuation of the PFAS leachate. I mean, are we even considering through residual un unclean pipes or systems or tanks uh, disposing of farms or roads? Uh, that's contaminated, and if so, I would really halt and, and design a, a different method. Uh, I want to offer into the record this article regarding Maine putting a do not eat order out of wild deer that have been feeding around peace pass contaminated. I didn't have a stapler. Uh, so the idea that we we know we've got this toxin in our systems now we're proposing to start drying our solids instead of hauling them to coventry but at what point are they going to be this this system can't go until we get the pfas out of our system it, that, that's what i'm uh asking you to consider uh with regards to bonding capacity uh I don't hear much discussion of what other competing. I, I would hate to think that this, you know, admittedly probably a state of the art combined facility might be further delaying our decades old deferred maintenance on our sidewalks and our streets and then our uh, re replacing failing water lines. You know, I, I don't know. I know those have different funds and all that, but I wonder at what point the public's going to say we've, you know, we don't want to keep funding for tens of millions of dollars. I know we need a public safety radio system and we need railings, streets, you know, sidewalks and, and water pipes. So I, I, I think keeping a, all of this on the table for the discussion is important. Well, I admire the engineering and like I said, the state of the art demonstration project. I want to first raise the red flag around the toxins because I'm not at all confident that uh, there's a resolve here to not uh, 
repurpose any dried solids uh, that have PFAS in them. So um, I'd ask you to fix the laptop and the projector, whatever it is, because it's really disruptive and it denies people the opportunity to even understand. The laptop won't go full screen with the projected presentation. The projector or something is blacking out way too frequently, interrupting your presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Um, anyone else, just in general? Is my question going to get addressed? Shrug your shoulder? I said maybe it will, maybe it won't, maybe not tonight. Well, her questions were addressed. Yeah. Um, all right. Other, uh, so let's move to opinions. Uh, what, where are you going to do? Actually, if I may oh, respond yeah, sure. to that. Yeah, yeah. The reason I was shrugging, Steve, is that the presentation made explicitly clear that the assumption was that we were not going to be accepting any more leachate with PFAS in it, and that all the economics were developed that way. And it was stated at least twice during that presentation. So then you came up and asked us about were the economics dependent on continuing taking leachate. So that's why I shrugged, because it helps when you pay more attention. I paid attention, okay. but you did All right. Residual Thank you. System. So we're going to move on to opinions. Council. Um, I'll just say for myself. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't. Hear. Oh, okay. Well, I was going to say, um, you know, just in terms of like the recommended action for you know tonight, if it's. Uh, you know, obviously, there's some more steps that we, we need to go through before we I get to the point of approving a bond, obviously, but in terms of moving forward, looking at um, project development, I, I think that is worth doing. Um, yeah, I, this, this seems like a really promising project. I, I'm very... Uh, 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 I'm very hopeful around the idea of pyrolysis as, pyrolysis as a, a mechanism to which PFAS, uh, who knows, we'll see if that um, turns out to be uh, scientifically true, um, but uh, that's that's encouraging to me, and I think all the assumptions that you all have made are, are pretty conservative, and that's really encouraging, um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, hopefully all the pieces uh, fall into place. That's that's where I'm at. Uh, others, yeah, go ahead, Donna. I'm there too. Yeah. Yes. Move forward. Um, we could. Uh, yes. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, I just I and thank you for <laughs> your thorough answering of uh, many many questions. Um, I I just like underscoring. I am concerned concerned about just like keeping an eye on the use of the biosolids like you know and I know that you guys are and are thinking about it I I am um, there's all kinds of contamination issues beyond PFAS with land applied but I think the benefits of removing the water and worst case it's going to the landfill with less water less trucking seems like a better outcome and a you you know beneficial use of the methane so I think in that regard if that's like the worst case scenario and then if you know Maybe there are some better technologies in the future, but um, just appreciate so much work and good thinking that's gone into it. So thank you all. Um, I think we could probably um, use a motion towards that. And if, unless other folks, I'm sorry, I know we haven't heard from everybody yet, but um, I don't want to jump the gun there. <laughs> sorry. Other thoughts, other comments? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm on the same page. It sounds like there's opportunities to continue asking questions about this, but. Fantastic presentation, guys. Really appreciate it. So I would, I would actually, um, at, the, at the risk of getting drawn and quartered by folks sitting in front of me, <laughs> I'd suggest that you not make a motion on oh, this okay. right now. You've indicated where you want to go, and I think that's really helpful. You have, um, to the point that Mr. Whitaker made, there are the bones being presented. You haven't heard the whole budget, and you owe it to yourselves and everyone else to um, see this in the context of the whole and not as an individual item is I support it and I hope you will support it um, as we go forward, but I think to just see it in isolation. Um, sure. As I said, we're, we've got 
we're going to do the budget right next. We have a full workshop next week that's all budget and nothing else. And you'll have you know ample time to vote on these and decide what you're going to put on the ballot and all that. I think the takeaway for me and I think the team is that you're enthusiastic about it, want to keep rolling with it. And um, I'd suggest that that's all we need for now. Unless, yeah. Unless other folks have comments. Go ahead, Jack. I, I agree with what I've heard. I think that uh, Mike and certainly I don't have the expert on, on this area. I, I think it's, uh, it's a great asset to the council and to the city that we have uh, council member Hurl who uh, who can get into great detail about these uh, these environmental issues, and I and I just loved having you here for that uh, and many other reasons. Um, <clears throat> and so, I'm enthusiastic about this. I'm, as uh, Bill said, I think it's very it's it's important to look at this in terms in the context of all the other potential demands for funding. But this this really seems like a good plan. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other comments folks would like to make? No? Okay, great. Um, thank you. Thank you all for that. That's uh, it's very encouraging and um, looking forward to hearing more. Um, before we move on to the budget, I just want to address Mr. Whitaker. Um, if you would please refrain from calling out comments or questions from your seat that is important and helpful and part of having an orderly process. And so if you would please control yourself to not do that, that would be great. Thank you very much. All right, now we are on to the budget presentation. Thank you, Doug. I think I've got to go down there. <clears throat> All right, I'm going to shift over here. Um, I think I can, can I replace the slideshow or do I have to just? Didn't you just do that? No, I did not. But I don't know if you were in the Well, how? So I've got to get out of this and go to. All right, and then back to this. Yay. Okay. I'll get this one of these days. Well, thank you very much. Um, we have been working diligently on the budget. We expect to have um, full budget books to you by the end of this week, so you'll have in advance of the uh, workshop next week to, to look through and see everything. My goal tonight is just to give you a pretty high level overview of where we're at and uh, acquaint you with some of the key issues in, in the budget um, and take broad questions. Uh, I'd like to, before we get started, really thank our team for, uh, as usual, a, a Great amount of teamwork to come up with uh, the plan. Uh, it was an you know an unusual year. Certainly, I'd like to thank Kelly Murphy for all the hard work she's doing, especially uh, as you'll see the budget book as we're using in the new budget software that we showed you. So it's all you know we're kind of learning that on the fly too. So we went into the budget this year, and we had key budget goals and, and challenges. One, um, you did such fine work on the strategic plan this fall and, and such clear work that we really felt uh, we, we, we always take it seriously, but this year we really were like, we've got to, you know, they've made some very clear statements. We need to make sure they're included. Um, at the same time, we were rebuilding from the COVID cuts of the last couple of years, deferred things. So a lot of pent up demand. Um, we had the, we, we still need to deliver our responsible services to our residents. Um, despite all of the extra things that we like to do, that really is the core of what we do. And um, our revenues are returning, but they're not quite where they were. So, you know, the good news is they're better than last year. The bad news is in some cases, they're not where they, they used to be. And then as uh, we've seen, inflation has gone up this year. We settled on a 6% inflation rate. That was, I think, based on the October uh, 
consumer price index of 6.2 uh, coupled with the November announcement by Social Security that they're going to be doing a 5.9% cost of living adjustment for next year. So we settled on six. Uh, the December numbers, I think, are coming out in a couple of days uh, for November. So, um, but that was what, that was our goal. Um, so looking at the strategic plan, I'm just going to try through one of the, we have a, a, an overall goal to improve community prosperity and included were uh, had including uh, as people may recall, we had $100,000 for years for economic development, which went to um, the development corporation. Last year, we cut that to 25,000. We are still wrestling with how to proceed with economic development going forward with the, the end of the development corporation. Uh, we put 50,000 in this year for two, to uh, uh, provide two uses of the funds. One is, we think it's time to review the economic development strategic plan, which initially formed NDC a few years ago, and uh, you know charted what were then the goals and priorities of the city. Um, you know, a major project identified in the plan was a hotel parking garage in the center of the city. So obviously, we we would want to look at that. But also, I think some other aspects of it. It all, you know, it, it certainly talked about us being a higher end hotel and. Uh, that that type of thing and that so I think we should at least look at that assumption and decide if that's still the way we want to go so we think uh, updating the plan uh, in and then having that work inform how we go forward with that the remaining funds would be used to actually assist us with economic development as we go forward this year um, you know, bringing in consultants as needed um, particularly folks like White and Burke to do a project analysis, that kind of thing to assist our, our existing staff for things that are a little bit beyond our scope. So it would allow for those two things. You had wanted to look at uh, school childcare. And as we look at rec center options, uh, that the idea of building that, fac that a facility for that is included in that. Um, we're looking at additional outdoor recreation, uh, including trails. The homelessness task force continued to be funded at $45,000 per year. The community fund is fully funded at last year's amount. Um, our Hillier Live is fully funded and we restored $10,000. Last year we zeroed it and we're recommending 10 this year. Um, under the responsible and engaged government, we have, uh, the website is due for an upgrade. Uh, so we have a proposal. So, um, included ten thousand dollars for the, the uh, capital area neighborhoods. It's twenty in this current budget. It had been traditionally up until then. We, uh, in trying to meet the goal, the financial goal that we were shooting for, which was to hold the city's budget within five percent. We know the inflation was six percent. We were really committed to bringing the city's portion of the budget in at five percent. Um, we, we went with that. We also include the ADA transition plan projects are in the, which was a priority are in the capital plan. One of your strong priorities was a fully staffed city department and that has been achieved. Um, all positions that were put on hold are fully funded and back to full staff. And we've proposed in one of the, uh, I'm gonna get in later some of the pots of fund, but uh, a way to look at our communications data and think about different ways to put information out um, helped at least in part by a suggestion from council member erickson uh, Crew housing uh, we've last year so we have housing at ten thousand dollars annually uh, last year we cut that to fifty thousand we've restored that back to one hundred and ten thousand for this year um, We've also included again in one of those funding sources, you had mentioned as a priority, a housing and services hub. It was a project that didn't have a lot of definition, but we put $100,000 in to set aside to assist whatever that project looked like. It could involve the group that we just heard from tonight. Maybe we mean something different. Um, we also, you know, I think I forwarded you a request from Downstreet to partner with a, a housing project. So anyway, we've included that in to try to address those needs. Under practice, good environment stewardship, we're proposing uh, funding actually in the bond for Confluence Park. The net zero plan listed series priority projects for the city. Um, the first two were the schools. 
um, which we didn't have any control over. And then there were three building projects for the city. One, and, and so the very first one was a pellet furnace at uh, DPW. So our proposal was that we fund that this year. And, um, and then after those three building proposals were uh, vehicles, and those that we know are gonna be more challenging in the longer term, but we're, we certainly appreciated the clarity of the net zero report and wanted to immediately take step at making those things happen. We also included dam removal seed money. Um, we estimated about $120,000 for a study to, to do this. We believe there will be um, funds available for looking at dam removal, so we're gambling on that a little bit, but we included, I think, those $34,000 in in case we needed a match or something like that. And we fully funded my ride again this year. Um, Build and maintain infrastructure. This is the biggest issue, obviously, uh, and it's also where most of the funding is. So the good news is we've increased the CIP capital plan funding about $250,000 from last year. The bad news is that still $230,000 below the target that we've been trying to accomplish and had been out the year before. So we basically built half of it back this year with a goal that we'll build another half back next year. Uh, however, we felt okay about that because of some of the availability of other funding. We have the ARPA funding. I'm going to talk a little bit more later. Capital reserve funding that I'll talk a little bit later. So included in these various pots of money is, a, is funding to get us to the level of 70 PCI street conditions. That won't happen this year. I mean, we won't get to 70 PCI this year, but if you recall when Zach Blodgett presented to you, said if we have a certain amount of money assigned each year, we will get there over the next couple of years. We can that amount of money. We've got $325,000 in for public restrooms, uh, obviously to be determined where and how, but we put funding in there. There's fundings to pursue the, the land for the rec center as, as discussed. East State Street, which is a combination street, water sewer, uh, combined sewer overflow, sidewalk project, um, the, the, uh, lighting the street lighting and those kinds of things for the Barry main intersection which we've studied and you'd approved an alternative for downtown street lights not only improving their performance but converting them from their current lighting to leds uh, so that would be more energy efficient and also um, higher performance and of course the uh, water resource recovery facility dryer that you just heard about oops what did i just do something i didn't want to uh, let's see yes okay I moved a slide, didn't I? Yes. Okay. Under the goal of uh, improved public health and safety, we've uh, we've expanded the social worker, the MPD related social worker, um, putting in another half. You may recall the the uh, police review committee. We currently have a half that's shared with with Barry and partly funded by the state. The police committee recommended that we put in another whole plus half of a peer support worker. We weren't able to do all of that, but we have included half of the new social workers, expanding our half to, to one full-time social worker. So that's what's in the budget. And we have 45,000 for home source goes in. If we want to talk about expanding that, that's a discussion we'll have to have. We did include the body-worn cameras. We, dispatch consoles had been in last year. So we didn't we haven't spent the money, so we're holding that because that um, those either can be used as matches for grants. We're pursuing some funding to move forward the move the Televate project forward. Um, so we're keeping that as as a our beginning funding for that. I I believe Barry is doing something similar, but I'm not sure. As you recall from when the chief was here, uh, many of the police re um, review committee recommendations are actually in the operating budget. Some of the training things and, and those sorts of things. So those are, are moving forward and specifically calling out the CIT, the crisis intervention training, which we are proceeding with. It does, again, does have a budget that's included in the operating plan for the police department. Uh, so to go to the cap room, and here's what we were talking about. You can see, uh, and again, you're going to get these charts. So if you can't read them, don't worry. They'll be all, all in the book. But this is showing that the, the uh, plan is up $223,000 from last year overall, which is about $20,000 less than the year before. 
There's a whole list of projects uh, that are proposed uh, within that funding. And again, uh, the guidance committee is going to be reviewing these on Monday. Is that right? Monday, uh, and then you, but they will also be included in your budget book. May change after approval. Um, and again, same thing. There's a list of equipment that's in, uh, included within the funding that we've. Um, Talked about that's where you'll find the body worn cameras, for example. I, I'm not going to get into detail, but we're basically breaking up our extra funding sources, what we're calling ARPA 1, ARPA 2, and the capital reserve. So, ARPA 1 is essentially the first million that we've re already received. And as it turned out, when we finally did the final calculations for um, lost revenue, it pretty much matched with that one million. So, with the exception allocated from that proposal is to use that funding for items that have been approved in prior budgets that we, we had to delay and uh, not do. So this list are all things that have been in previous budgets and we're going forward with that. Then we have ARPA part two, which is the new money this year, which is not eligible for lost revenue. So we're proposing to put about 75,000 into a community outreach type effort to deal to get some more data about community needs that were included in the survey. Figure out where prioritizing future events and also figuring out how we can communicate a little better. And uh, we were we were directed, this is where Council Member Richardson, uh, excuse me, Erickson gets the tape. He directed us to Montana, which uh, really showed uh, to uh, projects and things going on. And so we are, we're trying to figure out how to incorporate that in. Um, this could also be a place where we put in, uh, the mayor asked me about a C-Click fix solution. And this could all be part of us, you know, in terms of getting a sense of where community needs are. This is where we have the $100,000 for the housing and services hub. And we could define that more uh, fully. 320 restrooms, and then the remaining 500,000 for inf investment in water and sewer infrastructure. Obviously, uh, if you choose to do something different with this uh, or um, you know, do some sort of public processing, but uh, we just put the rest in. You know, we have uh, old water and sewer lines, and anything we can do to invest in those would be great, but it could also be used for other things. That's, that's our proposal. We have um, what we call the restoration reserve, and this is uh, Kelly will be able to explain this more uh, next week. How we use as we've been cutting our budgets and putting things on hold, trying to stay within. You know, we were doing some estimates, and some of our revenues came in a little better than a result some of these projects. But we had to put the reserve at the capital of thirty-five thousand, um, and that is not a normal thing that we have. And um, so we felt that since we're behind, we need to invest. So we're proposing to take 180,000 this year to reach the full funding for PCI. Um, and as I mentioned, next year, we're expecting to increase the capital plan budget by another 30,000. That's where that funding would come into that. So this is to kind of jumpstart that. We have 34,000 for the dam study included. And then again, more trucks that had, had been an equipment that had been proposed that didn't make it into the other funding. So trying to get, get caught up with where we've been. Certainly happy to look at all of this. And again, all of this will be reviewed by the Capital Projects Committee. But um, so then there's bonds. So even more infrastructure. We are proposing, we're suggesting that there's at least sort of five bundles of bonds. Obviously these can be bundled however council chooses. We could each each one of these could be an individual item. Uh, we could could potentially bundle the East State Street and the, the water resource recovery facility if necessary. But the first one is East State Street, 7.2 million. That includes 4 million from the general fund for the street uh, stormwater and um, sidewalk improvements, $2 million for water and sewer fund for, for subsurface. Uh, we're proposing 1.5 million for purchase of the property, uh, club property. Now, um, we think it's going to be in that neighborhood to give us site control and a future looking for 
lots of recreation opportunities. Then we have a group of infrastructure projects that have been talked about, the total 1.2 million, uh, the Barry Main intersection improvement, uh, the downtown street lights, the, the DPW heating system, uh, DPW garage, uh, but keeping it net zero, so we'll see. And then we have a failing retaining wall on Marvin Street that needs to be addressed. Uh, so we want that in here. Confluence Park, uh, we need about 600000 to complete that. If there's other external funding, that would be great. And then the water resource recovery facility that you just heard about uh, for $16.4 million. So um, you can see the totals there. Uh, as I said, they can be, be lumped however possible. Uh, I think it would be an interesting conversation whether we think, whether the voters would think that East State Street and the wastewater plant were related and so we're going to try to take a look at that. Also, know um, getting paid and I'll say that all, the funding for all of our plan because we will. Leave. Already, the, at least the first year payment, the payments that will come due in the FY23 budget. And as we've looked at the features, we built those in. So, so we can do them or not do them as you see fit, but they won't increase the budget for next year any more than what's already proposed. So, proposed is a tax um, property tax rate. Uh, about 6.4 cents, 5.5. I know I was five. The word, the city portion of the budget is 5%. The library's request for about 45% pushes us up to the 5.45%. So if you hold everything from last year to this year, uh, we're at five, and then, the, then that additional money. Reminder that last year's was only 0.6%. So really about 3% a year over two years. Um, and there you can see the city services are 5%. The library ballot adds a 0.45. We're not proposing any changes in the sewer benefit or in the CSO benefit charges. And we'll have all the detailed tax rate breakouts that we normally provide to you uh, when we get there. Um, so as we, we think about wrapping up, I would say that from, from our team, you know, you know, and this is for you to judge, not us, but we felt like we had um, state financial parameters that you'd indicated and had funded the lion's share of the strategic plan within those parameters. So hopefully we're making your work a little bit easily. Um, you know, we've got to try to get the budget done before the mayor goes out. So um, we're going to do heavy lifting in December this year. Um, yeah. <laughs> so just remind you of our schedule that next week, next week we're here in this room at 6.30 with not the capital plan committee and we'll have three hours or so to, to work on this. You'll have your spreadsheet that you can pop your options in and see how, how that works. Um, and it would be great if we, you know, some preliminary decisions after that. But if not, that's great. You've got more time. Uh, the following week is our regular meeting. We don't have a, a lot on the agenda, but we will have a couple. We will be setting aside time at that meeting as well to talk about the agenda. We have set aside Wednesday, January 5th for a budget workshop if we need it. So again, that would be budget only. Then we go to the formal public hearings on January 12th and January 20, and those will also be public hearings for bonds, uh, the, all the normal, the warning, the ballot, all the things that we normally do. Um, just so the way that works for um, the, the newer folks is typically the council adopts a budget prior to the public hearing. So we, we go to public hearing saying this is what the council is proposing, but the council could change it up until the 20th. So after you hear from the public, or just continue discussion. It's not final until you vote for the number that goes on the ballot. And then that, that's done because that's the number for the ballot. But it's, uh, again,
again, basically the way, you know, I propose you a budget to you, you work on that budget between now and January 5, and then you, then it becomes the council's budget being proposed to the public uh, for their consideration and then finally, of course. Then on Tuesday, March 1 is election day, uh, however that ends up looking. Uh, 7 a.m., 7 p.m., and early voting to start at least uh, February. And I know we have an item on tonight's agenda to at least discuss what those options might be. But that is our schedule, and that is all I have in my presentation. I'm certainly happy to answer questions about any of this uh, in big picture. As I said, you'll have lots of detail to look at um, coming up shortly. And if you don't need this, I can close this off and go back to my seat. I think, well, actually, I don't know. Um, knowing that we have a fair bit of time to continue to discuss this, any questions that folks want to ask uh, right now? Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just also want to um, say how uh impressed i i am with uh what you all have come up with you've managed to do quite a bit with um what was still not you know um the revenues that we hoped would be have bounced back by now so very grateful for um, the difficult conversations i'm sure that have happened um behind the scenes and um and that you've been able to to come up with this um Thank you. yeah absolutely and that's what I was say about that. I guess I think that's I think that's it for now for me anyway. Other thoughts, questions? Um, yes, Jack. Just a very uh, quick. One. I recall that the uh, Main Street and Barry Street intersection were different chunks. One was the uh, putting in electric light, and the other was. Uh, Paying for whatever is involved in coordinating the uh, the lights are those both in the um, what we've got here. I'm I'm going to defer that question to when there's someone better able to answer that. Okay. I think I know the answer, but I'm not sure. Fair enough. Uh, and actually, I do have one other question. Um, I think I probably misspoke in the wastewater recovery uh, facility. Uh, water resource recovery facility presentation um, because I saw that the total uh, cost was 16 million, but there were 4 million left over from the previous one. So I assumed that you could subtract, but that, I mean, in hindsight, right, like that was not a part of the original bond. So you couldn't just apply that 4 million to the next project. Well, possibly. Okay. So maybe. So, so we were, I was showing the highest okay. worst case. Okay. So, yes. And, okay. and so, and a couple things about bonds too. To be clear, um, uh, you can you can approve the bond but not spend all of it. So, f right. so again, if if you we were to get other funding for any of these sources, just because we voted it doesn't mean we actually would let all of it. You know, I, again, um, bad example really, but the, the parking garage bond is a, is an example of that. We we approved ten and a half million dollars. We only spent one and a, you know one point one million dollars, so that's all we're letting for bond. You know, even right. though we had that remaining approval, we're not going to ever use that because we don't need it. And so, if we were to get additional funding for a bond project, then we can do that. I don't know, Kelly, are you able to talk about the debt policy now, or do you want to hold that? Um, I, I it's think it's the council when it's ten o'clock. Yeah, I think it's okay to do that later. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah. For now, just in light of the the time for now, and knowing that we'll we'll have much more opportunity uh, to talk about that. Any other comments? Yes, go ahead, Connor. Quick was uh, was the the hospice uh, ballot item built into the yes number? It was great. Thanks. Okay. Any other comments, either in person or digitally? Okay, Lauren. Um, just curious when fully funding the staff, which I'm super excited to see. Um. We still we don't have an energy position like what Kate from MIAC. Right. So so when I say fully funded, last year we position. held six positions yeah. vacant. Yeah. Um, so we basically we restored all the existing positions. The only expansion of something that would be 
staff related was the extra half for the social worker. So there is not an energy position in there now, unless we were to okay. rework something. Yeah, yeah I just wanted to clarify. Get ready to uh, yeah. say that again. What? Get ready for that proposal. Yeah. Next week. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other comments? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just want to call attention to what the comment that uh, we're pursuing funds to implement the Televade project. That one caught me by surprise because this has been a confusion between what our police department does. Some of the investments in radio vehicle, radios, et cetera, in the police department budget that were pre-approved are being slipped back in here, even whether or not they're consistent with the design that has yet to been started, the engineering design. Televate was only a needs assessment. It is next phase is the engineering design. So it's premature to be spending money on towers and radios uh, for our police department that are not integrated with the regional plan that we're working on. But the idea that the city managers get together and launch their own initiative to but pluck off a piece of it before the engineering is done is totally inappropriate. So I just want to raise that red flag. You'll be hearing more about it. Yeah, thank you. All right, anyone else? Great presentation. That's Sets us up in good shape for next week. Yeah, I agree. Uh, all right, moving um, on uh, for that, I uh, we've got a couple. Oh, we have three more agenda items, and it is a little after ten. Um, so, I'm wondering if we can actually flip flop a couple of them. Like, it, I I would be in because I I know we really need to to talk about the election update um, that probably needs to happen tonight. Um, I would like to do the legislative agenda thing. I don't know how long folks think that will take, um, but I'm uh, curious for, for your thoughts. I mean, there. only if there's questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, well, let's let's do the, um, the election um, update, because I think that is going to be um, We've done the legislative agenda stuff before, so it's a little bit familiar. This is going to be, um, I think, a little bit uh, different. So, John, Good. are you okay to to um, go now? Sure. Um, okay. Now, I just uh, okay. warn you all. I've been having trouble with the sound, so I'm afraid it could be me. I'm on an island, off an island in the woods. Um, so, you know, hopefully, you all will be able to hear me. Um, I have a presentation just to try to focus the discussion, just so you all know, and I apologize, all of this stuff should have occurred to me uh, a month ago, but there were a lot of assumptions being made, uh, sort of assumptions made in silos, and I only put it all together myself a few weeks ago. And so suddenly we have uh, some questions that need to be answered. And I put a certain amount of urgency on the agenda, but given what's been happening with meetings of other bodies since then, I could wait till the 22nd to get the answers I needed if you all just wanna hear what's going on and think about it. Um, so the basic problem with the election coming up is the question of mail-in voting. I finally trained myself to stop saying all mail because that just sounds wrong when you say it. Um, mail-in voting and the fact that there are now going to be as many as four different discrete entities that are going to be involved in this election. So I'm going to share my screen if I can. Um, well, you're going to make me choose which screen. Fine. We'll do that one. We'll start a slideshow. And the slideshow is not starting. <laughs> trying to start the ah looky slideshow yay okay so i know you all in the past have wanted to you know regardless of what uh you know what's happening at the state level or what isn't wanted uh to do a we return to the mail-in election which we did before sponsored by the state um so this is coming if this is about that 
Now, the Montpelier Roxbury School District is in the process. They, the school board wants to do a mail in election as well. So they are in the process of working through that process, which uh, you'll hear about in a minute. So uh, the question is, what are the implications for Montpelier's decision to pursue, to proceed with the mail in election or not? And they are not insignificant. Okay, Roxbury's select board will decide on the 20th whether or not to allow the school district to proceed with a mail-in election. Now, the thing is, the way the law is written, the school district, if it straddles multiple towns, cannot simply decide on its own, we want to have a mail-in election. They decide that, and then the, the towns in question have to give their blessing, and it's all or nothing. So, if the school board wants to have a, a mail-in election, Montpelier says, yeah, it's great, come on in. Roxbury doesn't. They are not having a mail-in election. So you start to see where things start to happen here if the city decides to have a mail-in election, but the school doesn't. So to proceed, um, the school board is going to need to decide to proceed with an election, but also Roxbury is going to have to decide. Roxbury had the select board had an initial meeting on Monday and they punted their decision till the 20th. Uh, they had the members of the school board from Roxbury coming down, pitching them on it because it wouldn't cost them anything. Uh, it's just a matter of, it becomes just a philosophical question. Unfortunately, the, uh, uh, the Roxbury clerk who is also the school clerk is very much against it and is going to be arguing more vociferously on the 20th. So this is all a big question mark right now. Uh, it's hard to handicap what's going to happen here. So if we choose another mail in election, I'm going to assume at least to get going here, because I think the odds are, are more in favor of it. Assuming the school settles on a mail in election, then a shared ballot with the city and the school sort of ballot people are used to seeing will be mailed to all active voters in the city. Okay. That election will be coordinated through my office, even though it's, you know, technically two elections on one ballot. It's the way we've always done it. Um, and the school district then becomes responsible for most of the actual costs of the election, which is great. <laughs> Bad for them. Great for me. Uh, that includes ballot printing and mailing, you know, all the fees and the postage to obviously does not include the ballots for non-citizen voters. If there are any, we still have zero, but there's one I hear rumor about. Um, technically, they're responsible for ballot design, but, you know, I've always done that. I'm going to do it. It would just really make everybody's lives complicated if I didn't. Uh, the fraction of the cost of programming the tabulators equal to the number of questions minus the cost of programming non-citizens. And this sounds a little piddly because it may end up me billing them for only about 100 and 150 bucks, but um, that's something I'd still kind of like to do. And then half the cost of any part-time paid poll workers that I might need to bring on, which is a great insurance valve for me because as you all know, the we've been understaffed in the clerk's office. There's rarely a week goes by that we don't have to have some closures at some point from our normal, uh, you know, eight to four thirty, uh, five days a week schedule. So having that possibility there will be tremendously helpful. Now, if we choose another mail in election, the implications for the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority are significant because they are in the same boat as the school. The CVPSA would have to decide for their purposes whether to do a mail-in election. In the same way, it's all or nothing. Both the decision would have to also be given the blessing of the Montpelier and Barry City Councils. Okay, here's where it, here's, here's the deal, right? So now if they do commit, let's say this happens, if CBPSA gets permission and decides they want to do a mail-in election, they would share the physical ballot with us in the school as usual, and their questions would therefore be mailed out. Unfortunately, I think this is kind of a fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, at least it looks like a 
happy fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is a happy fantasy. <laughs> Because I mean, here's the thing: we might say, "Yeah," but Barry City they've they've already indicated they they do not they're not having a mail-in election. The clerk there is going to send out cards again to everyone, encouraging them to ask for absentee ballots. So imagine for a minute. Uh, first of all, they're not going to be inclined to, but if they did, then you'd have a situation in Barry where all the CVPSA separate standalone ballots they'd have to be separate would be mailed out to everybody in the city and the city ballot wouldn't be neither would the school so voters would be like what the heck is going on right um and that would that's not good for anybody because then the cvpsa would be on the hook for paying for that entire election which you know ten twelve thousand dollars possibly hey, as Jim, can it, i ask you a question about this uh CVPSA oh, sure. point mm -hmm. um are on this election, are there going to be uh, candidates running for at-large CDPSA seats? Yes, yeah. there's two slots open. And yeah. so what could potentially happen if CDPSA doesn't have a, a mail-in vote, and we do, then anyone in Montpelier who wants to vote in the CDPSA election would have to come in physically, even if they do everything else by mail, which I just anticipate that depressing turnout from Montpelier for the CDPSA election. You just took all the thunder out of the rest of most of my presentation. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, John. <laughs> I'm just thinking ahead. <laughs> man, and you told everybody, this is, this is terrible. <laughs> Oh, well, okay. So to, to go over some of that. Oh, well, there's another body in this too that I should mention. There's implication, the Central Vermont Career Center wants to break off and form their own school district. So there's very possibly, I think 50-50 at this point, also going to be a ballot situation, a question with them. So they would be in the same boat. Now, they could also choose to do a mail-in election. But CVCC serves 18 towns. Um, they're going to have to have a standalone ballot anyway. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly about the legalities of that. Carol Dawes is on that in Barry City. She explained it to me, and I was already, my brain was mush by that point. But they will have a standalone ballot. All 18 towns would have to authorize the mail-in election Otherwise, it will only be available at the polls. Are they going to authorize it? That one is a total fantasy. That's <laughs> not going to happen in a million years. I'm, I'm hoping there's some Buffy fans out there. Anybody remember that? Oh, well. It was a great episode. Anyways. So here's our most likely scenario in a, in a mail-in election. Should you all... <laughs> The mission should you all choose to accept it right um that montpelier city and the school questions would share a ballot which would be sent to all active montpelier voters non-registered voters would only would receive a ballot only containing the city questions uh cvpsa ballots would only be available or at the polling place or by specific absentee request and CVCC ballots would only be available at the polling place or by specific absentee request. So what this means, yes, Jack, you stole my big moment here. <laughs> this is going to mean very, very low turnout for CVPSA and the Career Center. I mean, we could be looking at, based on last time around with this, you know, overall city turnout could be... Um, 2,700, 3,000, maybe even a smidge more voters. And in that CVPSA ballot, you know, they might only get four to 600 votes. Um, now, I, I don't, I'm not going to handicap whether that's a good or a bad thing, but it's just a thing, you know. Um, so now, in case you're, even though your brains are probably melted already, what if the school doesn't opt for a mail in election? You can probably see where this is going. The Montpelier City, and this is also assuming that you all do. 
A Montpelier city only ballot would be sent to all active voters. A school only ballot will be available at the polls or by absentee request only. And then you get the other two, the CBPSA, the CBCC, although at least the CBPSA could be in a position to possibly arrange mm-hmm. something and, and share with the schools. Now, the schools then have to pay for their own election under this scenario. So they're paying for all their ballots. They're doing all that. Um, obviously, I'm going to coordinate the, you know, the, the actual functioning of the election. And because, you know, if this were happened, I, you know, we'd manage their absentee requests too, just because I can't imagine the chaos if I didn't. Um, so anyway, so you could theoretically have someone go to the ballot to get three different or to go to the, to, to the polling place to get three different ballots that they didn't receive in the mail, potentially. Um, anyways, now, if we opt against a mail-in election and we withhold the approval for the schools to proceed with one of their own, then elections proceed as usual, with the exception of that standalone CBCC ballot, which would be available um, at the polls, should that actually happen. Well, now you get into the philosophical question here, and this is where it gets really tricky is what's the right thing to do here, because this, um, you know, the the August and November elections are going to be mail in the state handles those they've decided that's the law. Uh, You know, we had ours last time, so this is no longer theoretical. Um, There is no, no inaction. There is the action to decide to provide these ballots by mail, or there is, given the new paradigm of most elections, there's going to be the the decision to limit access to the ballot. And the way this is shaken out, those are sort of the two choices. There isn't just a, there's no longer a close your eyes and, and look away possibility here. I think that question has been called. So that makes it tricky. So how should you proceed? If you don't want any mail in elections, do nothing. That's um, easy. If you want to allow the school district to proceed with the mail in election, you need to pass a motion to give them your blessing to authorize them to do it. Um, And if you want to have a mail in election of your own, obviously, you have to pass a motion saying we're going to have a mail in election. So or <laughs> there is a big or, and that is that the legislature is working on a new emergency election bill. Now, when they did one last time, I was involved in all those discussions. So I got to go to the meetings and I got all the gossip that I knew what was going on. I guess they got tired of me. I don't know. They didn't, did not invite me to these. So, um, and it's, it's, uh, it's hard to gleam what this, what's happening and what's going on. I've spoken to uh, both chairs of the respective government operations committees. Um, I've spoken with legislative council about, uh, about all of this and about how in the future, what we'd like to see is, because this is all a disincentive for mail-in elections, all this hoo-ha. And we want to incentivize it, right? It's why we have the ability to do it at all. So the idea that the legislation ultimately needs to change so that if a multi-municipality entity uh, holds an election, that that election could be held under whatever the paradigm of that each individual municipality is. So, you know, ideally, if there's a question about CVPSA, um, well, We have a mail-in election in Montpelier, so it's a mail-in election in Montpelier. They don't have one in Barrie. It's not in Barrie. That's what would be the simplest, clearest path of least resistance for running these things. Um, And so that's what I'm advocating for. Um, And that may or may not happen because I know there's some folks who just really don't like this whole paradigm at all. But this emergency legislation at least Senator White told me she's hoping it's basically going to do everything their other COVID emergency legislation did, which would mean we'd have a repeat of last year, 
we just get all of it paid for. We could all on be on one big happy ballot. Life is good. And this whole mess gets put off to another year. And who knows, maybe by that other year, they can clean it up the way I asked them to. Um, I, it won't if I'm the only, the lone voice in the wilderness on that. So maybe that can be something added to the, the lobbying list that y'all are working out. But so the or is maybe everything I just told you doesn't, doesn't matter, basically. But that's what I got. So if you all have any questions or where you go from here, obviously there's going to be a need for some decisions there. But since Roxbury has, has punted on their decision on the school until the 20th, and I'm not going to be able to get anything done, you know, in this regard, December anyway, since you all are meeting again this month, I would just ask that you try to give me something, uh, you know, by, by before January. Does all that make sense? Yep. Yeah, yeah I think that makes yes. sense. Okay. Oh, so we don't need to um, make a decision on anything tonight. You don't have to. Um, I, thank you for, for this update. It's good to know that this is like something that I have to consider. Well, thank you. Um, and I do see your hand, uh, Vicki Lane. Go ahead. Oh, and then Donna. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I'm concerned uh, with the idea that the school could um, have their own thing and then they would have to pay for it. But what it really means is they can have their own thing and pass it on to the taxpayers because that's exactly what they'll do is they'll include it in the budget and we'll pay for it as part of our property taxes. Um, and that I don't, I don't find that to be particularly palatable. Um, thank you. Well, we, Vicky, if the we, city well, pays for it, it's still paid for by the taxpayers. Yes, I know. But if we have to pay for more than one election, you know, I mean, I don't mind paying for one election, but I don't want to pay for three just because people can't get their acts together. Just no. to um, to clarify on that, right now our normal pattern is we we do pay for three elections. They're just a three for they're a three for one. They're all paid for together, um, and depending on how this works out, if the schools end up essentially having to run their own election, then yeah, I can see how you could yeah. argue that that would be coming from two different directions now. Yep. Um, yeah. So I, I, it, I appreciate it. It'd be another reason for them um, to. And uh... So, so let's. I prefer to not get into a back and forth here. Sorry. Vicky, okay. I'm going to let you say one more thing, and then we're going to move on. Okay. Oh, I, I was just going to say it's just, um, you know, another way for them to. I just don't understand any of that crap. Yeah. Fair. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> fair. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Well, my question, and John, thank you. You gave me a heads up on this. I appreciate it. But your comment that school mail in, is there a time, a day, um, a deadline on that for that authority to the school if it were decided? No, I mean, it's just a matter of having all your ducks in a row by the, by the time the election deadlines come. It's not like... It's not part of a sort of standardized election process. It's just election law. It's election regulation. It doesn't say it's not like, uh, you know, candidate deadline or certain public hearing deadlines. It's just this and is it, these are the rules for running the election. So you got to figure it out before you get into it, basically. So if indeed the council, though, decided to do the mail in and, and gave the school the author approved the school do it. Does that give them any initiative, any momentum to do it? I uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think so because I think okay. there's an assumption that they've, you know, you've got their back with stuff anyways. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, you were cutting out a little bit, so I may be making some assumptions on the question. Well, I was just trying to think if there was a way, indeed, if the council favored mail in. If we could influence a school, 
<laughs> you know, whether that's by giving them uh, approval early or then they have their own decision, but they know that we've already said yes uh, to the possibility. Uh, even if we just did like a straw ballot, not making a firm decision, waiting to see what the school did. Well, that's 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 what I thought you were asking, even though I only heard every other word. But, I, you know, uh, and my honest answer is I don't know, because, as I say, they already sort of assume that we've got their back on it. And it seems to be something they want to do. Now, of course, they could change their minds and I could be wrong. But I've been speaking with uh, Jim Murphy and, you know, there's a very sort of assumptive tone between us that we would all like this to happen. So um, I don't know that it really makes any difference. I don't also don't know and this could be me being my you know paranoid self um if making such a decision and getting into the papers before roxbury has made their decision could you know kick off some of that big bad montpelier telling us what to do kind of vibe um i you know that may be completely unfair to say um but it just occurs to me so we can't even like offer encouragement. Oh, you could pass something today, say we authorize. Um, but um, I don't know. I mean, whatever you all want to do, it's um, I okay, that's, this you. is just me talking off the top of my head. Yeah, so I don't you. really but know. Thank you for doing the slides. Very helpful. <laughs> sure. and, and the pretty pictures, too. <laughs> um, Connor, go ahead. Hey, John, no worries if you don't like the exact numbers, but how did our mail in? turnout stack up against like a comparable election like one where there wasn't a presidential primary did we see a big increase there um we we didn't see as much of an increase as i would have thought i mean and based on the other numbers around the country but it was big it was definitely big and there's no question that it was bigger than it otherwise would have been so it does have an effect i think that's that's easily demonstrable um that's just i'm just geeking out a little bit saying i expected more but yeah no it was way up great uh steve uh i i'm not an expert on this but uh i did appreciate uh john's presentation uh a couple things come to mind it, it strikes me as it's almost the risk of disenfranchising uh a lot of voters uh, which we you know, loathe when Texas does it intentionally, uh, is not worth, if we've just imposed a mask mandate, we can put air cleaners in. It, it's almost akin to a jury verdict, has to be unanimous. And that if we know Roxbury or Berry City is going to prevent that, we've created this mess with our overlapping jurisdictions. And I just think that at this point, my advice is to plan, encourage people to do absentee voting, but plan for a real election in order to get it all on one ballot, because there's no way anybody's going to understand the complexity that John just so eloquently laid out for y'all. And a whole lot of people are, votes are not going to be made or not going to get counted. And I just think that's too great a risk, especially at this critical time in the evolution of CVPSA. So, uh, that's, that's my advice. Go for a regular election. Thank you. All right. Any other? Oh, Jack and then Jay? Or Jay and then Jack? Either. You go ahead, Jay. <laughs> Just a quick question, John. Thank you for the presentation. But um, what's the, you, you talked about the possibility of the legislature, you know, passing emergency rules for, for this coming um, election. What's the timing on that? They're going to pass something the first week of January. They said they're going to pass it more quickly this time than they did the one last time, which was in, within the first two weeks. Um, and it's, uh, you know, right now the energy is all, you know, there's, there's the, the, just the, the Omicron happening. Um, people are, <laughs> there's momentum for it. So uh, I honestly, I think there's a pretty good chance you're going to see the same thing pass again. Cause I do think there's, still money for this but i don't know how much we hang our hat on that probably should proceed as though it's not jack um i'm thinking about terminology uh you've been referring to an all mail-in election 
but what that really means is ballots get mailed to everybody, but nobody is stopped from coming in in person and voting in person if they want to do that. Um, right. Geezer that I am, I love to come in in person to, uh, to vote at the election, but uh, objectively, it just it seems that having creating the structure that gets the most people to vote is objectively the most democratic uh, way to do it, which makes me uh, lean very strongly in favor of uh, doing mail-in for the city and voting to authorize all of these other bodies to uh, vote uh, by mail also. Fair enough. Um, well, so this is something that we are going to be talking about again, uh, presumably, right, John? Um, yeah. So any other comments that folks would like to offer this evening? Okay. All right. Thank you, John. That was amazing. Um, uh, it was, yeah. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen a GIF in... Uh, in a council presentation before, so. we're, gonna, we're gonna have to up our game. You didn't uh -oh. see a GIF, you saw a GIF. GIF. Thank oh, you I very much. I always get it wrong. <laughs> I'm, I, always, I, I'm I not. Think, an, uh, no GIFs. No GIFs. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So I, 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 well, I, uh, just, just, uh, you asked the question with the voter turnout, and um, I'm track of them every year just because I'm interested in like the, 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 the city budget votes, but I have the combined total. So we had 2,800 votes, 2,842 voted on the city budget last year. And in, in a non-presidential election year, which are always the highest, that's the highest one I have during my time here. The next highest was 23 something in like 2015 or something. Um, so we had 32 the year before it was the president primer. And, um, but it was still a pretty, it's still like the fourth or fifth highest turnout, even including presidential primaries during my yeah. 26 cool. years. So definitely a higher turnout. And a thousand more than two years. 2021 was 20. History would have suggested we were going to break 3,000, but um, yeah. you know we're making our own history here, right? Fair enough. All <laughs> uh, right, just I uh, want to check in here, team. We're at 10:35, um, and we have one other item that I well, the executive session. I assume that we really do need to do that this evening as well. Um, do you want to also tackle the legislative agenda? I have one suggestion for that. We can do it. Okay. We're here. Let's, let's make it happen. All right. Um, legislative agenda. Anything um, that crew, the committee would like to say about legislative agenda? Introducing it. I, I mean, a lot of it's just chasing the dollars, you know. Um, it, it's going to be really important to, you know, pay attention to the appropriations committees and all the moving pieces. Because uh, that's going to inform, like, you know, what we can do with some of these other agenda items. But, but we have things like, you know, the dams in there. We've got, like, the public restrooms in yeah. there. Um, absolutely, like Lauren's all over PFAS, like, white on rice there. So, uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, but a lot of it, I, I mean, I'd, I'd probably turn it to Bill because he did the draft. But it, it's not too dissimilar to, like, last year's right. legislative agenda. Aside from the current the current stuff we're dealing with, we basically just went through last year's, got rid of the stuff that was outdated, and added the, this year's new things. And I took the liberty of adding the highest priorities at the end and sent them out to everyone, and no one said those weren't it. So, uh, you know, I I'm remiss in that because I would um, uh, recommend that we add one other thing to the highest priorities, um, which is. Um, Trying to find the exact wording here. Uh, it's the item that includes uh, funding for net zero stuff. I mean, that's that's something that we will probably spend a lot of money on. And so, if, if we can get state dollars for net zero um, infrastructure 
that is uh, i'll speak for myself that's a high priority for me <laughs> but i think it is a high priority for for everybody so yes jack if you look at the top of the back page the third bullet advocate for oh, climate is. change mitigation includes so add zero that to the... yeah that's that's the one um if we can add that to sure. to the list of highest priorities if that's okay with folks i mean i mean i realize that makes it five bullet points but i'm not sure that that matters too terribly um do we need to you need a motion do we need a motion we i think might as well go for I'll it. make a motion that we adopt the presented 2022 legislative agenda and thank lauren and connor and whoever else worked on it thank jack thank you thank you thank okay. you we have a, um, a motion a second we have some discussion here um steven you can go first and then morgan i just want to raise the issue the uh especially when you're talking about dam removal we've just been through a real community traumatic event with a garage I think most of you are going to should be conflicted out from recommending removing Act 250 jurisdiction on any projects with the city. Uh, anyone, anyone who supported that garage fiasco should not be missing uh, that protection against a stacked development, uh, stacked council in the future. That's just very, very dangerous ground to go to. So with that one exception, I support the other uh, legislative agenda, but Act 250 removal within the city is, should not be on that list. Thank you. Um, I will also add that uh, that is not how we use the word um, conflicted. Uh, that means, um, go ahead. Yes, Morgan, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Um, just so if John Odom's still on, John, it's not just you. Uh, there's a sound quality problem. Uh, I'm no techie, but I think it might be a bandwidth problem, maybe on the city's end. I don't know. I have no idea. Anyway, um, I'm glad you took up uh, the 2022 legislative agenda because I missed it last year. So you know, I didn't get into the weeds on things, but I looked at tonight and I have a question and uh, two or three comments. Uh, under create more housing, uh, I'm all for the first item, first bullet item, of course, uh, additional funding uh, to agencies such as Downstreet to build housing, great. Uh, the second item though, um, Here's the alphabet soup again. ADUs. What's an AD? What's an ADU? I have no idea. And uh, then um, I have a problem. All right, I'm all for anything that creates more housing. That's really essential. However, the next item. I have issues with eliminate Act 250 regulation and designated downtowns or growth centers. Well, unless you're more specific about that, you know, uh, what you're asking, that opens up a can of worms, in my opinion. And, uh, you know, I mean, people, if you, if you do that, all kinds of problems could crop up, including you know, there's all these people who they're very interested in developing housing, but it's not necessarily affordable, you know, and uh, you take out Act 250 regulation. I'm, I'm no lawyer. I'm no geek on any of this stuff, but, you know, I, I have a problem. Now, if you, if you do modification in these regards, that's a little different as long as it's tweaked very carefully, you know, and it's centered around housing, but you're not really saying that in that, you know, sentence, that, that bullet item, you're not being specific and it'll be really important to be very specific. And even then it's kind of a can of worms. It really is. And 
you know, that said, I'm all for more housing. Then the last item I have is down under practice good environmental stewardship. You know, continue uh, the bullet item on continue funding micro transit opportunities. First off, you know, if you're talking about my ride, not everybody's a big fan of that, and there's a lot of problems with it. However, I'll stick to, you know, environmental stewardship. Well, you know, I've gone by the transit center many a time in the back, walking along the path behind the, the building, and there'll be buses sitting out there running, idling for a long time, more than one bus sometimes. You know, and that's a problem. Now, I did bring it to the attention of somebody at uh, Sustainable Montpelier Coalition, and, you know, it's sort of going to address a little bit. Sometimes they're not running, and that's good. But, you know, especially for the Bur Berlin route, route, I'm all for the Montpelier part, but the Berlin loop, you know, these buses, the gas, uh, fuel guzzling, huge taxis, oftentimes empty, you know, and they're taking six to eight trips up the hill when before, you know, sometimes they were empty here and there, but they'd be running up the hill with up to four to six people, sometimes more, you know, or down the hill, one or the other. And, you know, it's costly. And it's also, you know, they're going up more times now with maybe one person on the bus and sometimes empty because sometimes they're not picking somebody up in the hill, right? So they're empty on the way down. So what's the point? You know, environmentally, environmental stewardship? I don't think so. Anyway, that's my take. Uh, thank you. If, if I may. Thanks, Morgan. Yeah, go ahead. ADU stands for Accessory Dwelling Unit. And so it's allowing people to put Thank an extra you. unit into their house. Um, quickly, on, on the Act 250, uh, I would point out that under a designated downtown's Act 250, um, it's already exempt uh, in those areas for some for most projects. And this has been a policy position of the city since before the parking garage got involved in this. Um, housing is one of the few things that housing over 50 units is still regulated in Act 250 in a designated downtown. And our argument is that if you're going to build high rise housing or whatever you're gonna build, it ought to be in the center of a downtown and not out in the field. The whole point of Act 250 was to prevent sprawl and push uh, development into downtowns. And so Act 250 should not be used as a tool to prevent uh, what is otherwise allowed um, development in downtown. So I agree with that. The only reason in fact that the hotel became part of Act 250 is that someone had ruled that hotel units were equivalent to housing units. Hotel rooms were equivalent to housing units because it had 80 rooms um, that got pushed in. As a hotel itself, it would have been exempt, as was the parking garage. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Bill. Right. Any Appreciate other the clarification? Um, so th thank you, Morgan. Any other comments or questions? All right, Lauren. Sorry. Um, I, I had... I, I know that like we've had that before. I was wondering about possibly rewording the Act 250 to say support smart growth policies that encourage and, and incentivize housing development in designated downtowns or growth centers. I think like it's well understood that Act 250 is part of it, but I think there's also more policies that are going to be considered this year lumped into smart growth and incentive programs. I would support that if it also said including removing um, Act 250 regulations for downtowns. I don't love that phrase. <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, I think that would be part of a negotiation, but to me, it's like if you're going to remove that, I would hope that there's like better forest protections and yeah. other things paired with it, just removing exemptions without a broader smart growth approach. As I mean, there's like a smart growth designation bill that's going in. So I think this is like in line that that would change Act 250 jurisdiction in downtowns and like would essentially accomplish this, but it just has more parameters around it than just eliminate. So I think it's getting at basically the same thing, but, but other jobs. Again, these are 
broad strokes, when you go in there and actually talking to people, you can add the smart growth, you can add whatever. But I think this really nails it personally, that, that they're not looking at all the motivation of why we have zoning and why we have Act 250 in the more rural areas like Bill brought up. And so I don't want to overwordsmith this. And if we do, then I, I suggest we put it off. It's almost 11 o'clock. So. Other thoughts? Jack, go ahead. I'm happy to put it off to probably, and probably not next week because we're doing budget, but if there are other substantive comments that people have that they'd like to see change, I'm happy to push it back. Do we have a date for the delegation coming in to talk about it? Well, that's, the, that's the only timing thing, actually. We haven't, we haven't invited them yet. We're pending to see what happened tonight. We would tentatively hope to have them in on the 22nd to go over this with them. I mean, I think we could still go over the ideas with them and maybe get some feedback from them before you adopt it. So um, or that could still work. That's what you want to do. Idea. I'd like to, yeah. to get their feedback on it. Yeah. Option. Yeah, send them the draft. Could like okay. they, like Perchler could be like ah, over here. Sure, that sounds good. Yeah, good. I mean, I guess along the way, I see us changing this all the time, folks. Yeah. And so we, I'm, I'm just a little frustrated, and uh, that we spent 20 minutes on this to say we're going to put it off, but that's been changes happen in the state house. So this is like in granite. I think it's in paper. <laughs> so that's you know, we do have a motion. I actually, put them on the floor. I'd like us to at least adopt this draft, move forward with for discussion purposes. Yeah. Well, I think we had a, we had a motion in a second. I mean, we could. Um, the the alternative is to table it, right? But um, yeah. Go or, ahead. or we could just take out the active fifty line for now. Pass the rest of it. And then suffer over it later. Do we get something done? What do you? I mean, is that amenable to the? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But that doesn't. I mean, you know, vote it down, and then you can have another motion. <laughs> um. Okay. Uh, Jack. As a point of order, do I'm not sure I heard a second. Did so? Did somebody second? I'll second it if we don't have one, but uh, I don't. Okay, one. Maybe the clerk knows. Had, maybe I had imagined that. John Odom, do you have any recollection of this? John is probably not John's there. John's going to go through the record. He's yeah. still here. Well, if nobody remembers second, I thought. Oh, no, you, you can't unmute himself? Unmuted. There, I got yeah. unmuted. That wasn't able to unmute. Uh, I was going to ask the same question. <laughs> Did anybody recall second? Um, so, so now it's me. <laughs> okay, so so Jack is seconding. Uh, all right, so I'm I'm, you know, whatever happens is all good. We'll talk through it, or you know, either now or we'll, or either we'll pass it or we'll talk through. I mean, we're going to talk through it again later. Um, but uh, nonetheless, here we are. So, do we have um, any further comments? The motion is as is. As is. As yeah. is. Yep. Well, I assume with the addition of with the, the changing the priority. Highest priority. Okay. Is that yep. is that fair? <laughs> okay. Um, uh, all right. So, um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. I mean, I, nobody opposed. Did I, I think at least I didn't hear any opposed. Um, so I think the motion passes. Um, and. Nice. So uh, we are going to revisit it. We keep talking about the Act 250 part of it, and that is fine. Um, all right, so moving on. Uh, we've got uh, one more item, possible acquisition of land near Berlin Pond. Uh, whew, all right. Uh, and for this, I'm anticipating that we may want to go into executive session. And uh, actually, before we do, anticipate coming out to make any decisions. Uh, I feel like maybe, we might. Yes, we, yes, might. we might. Okay, so um, just want to make that note before we get in. Jack? 
through 20. And then do that. And good call. Good call. Yeah, let's do that. Uh, council report. Um, it, are we? I yeah. have nothing. Move on. Okay. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, Jack. Um, uh, one that I should have mentioned when we were discussing the uh, consent agenda. One of the items we uh, passed was funding for uh, for a mini excavator for parks. And uh, when I saw that item on the agenda, I asked the manager if uh, if we had investigated uh, the possibility of getting an electric uh, excavator uh, in consistent with our uh, interest in moving towards electric vehicles when we can. And the answer was yes, that uh, it was investigated and uh, it would have been prohibitively expensive. We're spending somewhere around forty-five to fifty thousand dollars for this, and to buy an electric one would have been another forty thousand. So we are, for people who are interested, we are looking at uh, electric vehicles when we can. But this would not have uh, been practical at this at this point. Um, and the other thing is to follow up on the. Uh, on the reapportion because we discussed it before and we also fill your house district into two um, the uh, reapportionment board uh, decided to create all single member districts um, and you know the clerk and I were having a uh, conversation earlier, and we could get into the same thing here because the the vote on the board uh, in favor of this single member plan, the way the uh, members of the board lined up in voting was very very weird. From the most farthest left and farthest right member. Um, single member districts going to be decided by the legislature, not by by this board. So a lot a lot of towns didn't like the single member district idea, and it's I, I would be surprised if it stays this way. <laughs> That's all I've got. Thank you. Great. Uh, okay, I. Um, also, don't have anything. John, anything from you? There we go. Just that the office is going to be, uh, my office is going to be closed tomorrow because of a staff crunch. Um, and it will be open on Friday, but neither myself nor Crystal will be there. So it's really going to be limited to payments. Thank you. Uh, Bill. I'll pass given the hour. Okay, super. Uh, all right, so I think we are anticipating going to executive session, and I just want to make sure that when we do that, that we also invite or make sure that we're clear that we're inviting Christine Zaki. Okay. Yes. Okay. Still on? I, yeah, she, she was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, go ahead, Jack. I move that we find that uh, premature general public knowledge would place the council or a person involved at a substantial disadvantage concerning uh, a potential uh, real estate uh, transaction. Your second? I'll second it. Okay. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, so uh, we may be coming back to um, take some action. Yes. I move that we nope. enter executive session <laughs> to discuss <laughs> too. Thank the you. possibility of a real estate transaction pursuant to one BSA section 313A1, um, whatever the subsection is. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? A second. Okay. Um, for the discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. All right. So 
we may be back. Matters. Is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Okay. And is there a motion? Uh, no, wait a minute. Slow oh, down. Oh, oh. I think we need to make sure we're, we're in, in the right place. Well, here, are we, are we on? Testing still? Okay. Yeah. Then I think we're okay. Do you want us to wait till? Okay. Uh, yes, go ahead, Jay. So I'd like to make a. Um, make a motion that we authorize the city manager to. Uh, Pursue and enter, enter into a purchase and sale agreement for a uh, lot adjacent to Berlin Pond based on the conversation and the parameters established in executive session. Second. Is the word adjacent okay? Yeah. Close enough? Okay. Uh, okay, so there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, and so with that, uh, we are done with our business for the evening. Uh, so we will, without objection, adjourn at eleven nineteen. Right. Woo! Good job. We made it. Good meeting, folks.